Okay. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Please take your seats. So this is night two, hopefully uh, two of two, for the 2019 Hopkin Hopkinton Annual Town Meeting. Uh, once again, counters have been assigned under the direction of our Deputy Town Moderator, Ellen Rutter, and I've been informed that it's her birthday. So on three, let's say happy birthday, Ellen. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Ellen. Thank you. A reminder about the bounds of the hall. Non-voters should have a paper pass seated on the first few rows on my right. Media members sit in the front row center. No standing in the aisles during the meeting other than to address the meeting. No eating or smoking. Uh, only registered voters are entitled to sit in the voting areas of the hall, which, which represent all of stage left, all of stage center, and stage right behind the yellow tape. So if you're a registered voter, you should be in those sections of the hall. We have a quorum. Uh, we have a quorum. Anyone who wants to speak to the meeting should rise, come to a microphone, and ask to be recognized. When you're recognized, please speak into the microphone so that you can be heard. Only those who are recognized can speak, and they should stop when asked by the moderator. Presenters of articles will have three minutes to make their presentations. Other speakers will have two minutes to speak unless the moderator allows an extension of time. A speaker may have a second opportunity to speak only when others have had a chance to enter the discussion. All questions go through the moderator, no debating. Please do not stand other than to address the moderator or to vote. And as always, no clapping nor shouting in the hall. If you're proposing an amendment, Please state it at a microphone. It must be written legibly and presented both to the moderator and to the amendment desk at the back of the hall. Please be respectful of meeting members' times and have your amendment ready as quickly as possible. Okay, with that, we're ready to begin this evening. And we're now on Article 25, Purchase of a Ladder Truck. Board of Selectmen, Ms. Wright. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements Committee recommends approval. And now Mr. Manning for Appropriation Committee. Article 25, Purchase of Ladder Truck. We move the motion as written in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is uh, $1.2 million uh, general fund borrowing. Um, it will require a, uh, um, a ballot vote. And this is replacement of the existing 1999 ladder truck that was purchased used in 2016. The existing ladder truck has limited clearance on the back end to the roadway during uh, change of grade situations. It is excluded debt, by the way. Um, before I ask the fire chief to come forward, indulge me for one minute. I forgot to mention that um, in terms of timing for this evening, I would like to conclude the meeting, I, I would like to conclude all of the articles this evening, if at all possible. Um, and so, if I believe around 11 o'clock that we can reasonably finish uh, shortly after 11 o'clock, I would like to have the meeting continue. If it, be, uh, as we approach 11, if it becomes clear that that simply isn't going to happen, then we'll follow last night's protocol and will conclude this evening's session with the article that is under consideration at 11 o'clock. Okay, with that, far, uh, Chief Slayman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, uh, everybody, for this opportunity. Three years ago, I presented a revised capital plan to the town meeting. The plan solved for our need of a ladder truck. It also downsized our pumper fleet by one pumper. The solution involved the purchase of a ladder truck with a pump, which is known as a quint. And Josh, if I can just have the slide up top. 
I reported that this used ladder would be a great proof of concept prior to asking town meeting for over a million dollars for a new piece of equipment. And then finally in that meeting, I uh, asked you all to realize that purchasing a used piece of equipment especially in the range that we were looking at, which was going to be uh, quite an older one, it ended up being a 1999, um, that we needed to realize we would need to replace it in a reasonable amount of time, and I said probably five years. So tonight, I'm asking for support in the purchase of a new ladder truck. I'm reporting to you that the concept, a quint, which is up on the screen, I'm hoping, a quint carries fire hose, it has a water tank, it has a uh, pump, it has ground ladders and aerial ladders and it allows us to do multiple purposes. Its big advantages is in a town like ours when you have limited resources we can be on one piece of equipment and accomplish many tasks. Josh, if I could go to the next slide. So in addition to replacing a piece of equipment that's 20 years old, the new engineering has quite a few advantages I just want to bring to your attention. The maneuverability on the new engineering can turn in a radius of 36 feet 9 inches. And the one that we purchased 20 years ago was actually very advantageous to turn. It turns in about 40 feet and it had an axle that actually assisted in that. Um, but the new technology really gives us a chance to uh, get in cul-de-sacs that were never even designed for a ladder truck to turn in. It has, um, as it mentioned in the uh, finance report, the increased angle of departure. The one flaw in the ladder that we purchased is it has six degrees clearance on the rear end. So in a town like ours with a lot of change of grades, when we're entering hills, parking lots that have um, angles that uh, switch rapidly, uh, the back of the ladder truck can bottom out earlier than what a current NFPA standard would be of 10 degrees. Also the improvements are the outriggers. Um, Josh, if I could just have you go to the next slide. Here's an example of our existing ladder truck. The outriggers reach about 17 feet 6 inches out. Some of the newer technology that we're going to look at is they build a ladder truck that um, can jack inside of 12 feet. We're going to examine whether we can work that in Hopkinton. It will do almost the exact same as a heavy duty ladder like we have will do, yet it will fit in some narrow roads. It will fit in a parking lot. Um, when we go to some of the facilities, large buildings, the parking lots are full and we have very limited place to set up. So on the next slide, Josh, you'll see some of the examples. So that's only a 12 foot jacking setup. Um, that can get set up in a driveway. Believe it or not, everybody thinks of a ladder truck for tall, large buildings, but we use it quite a, bit, quite a bit. Its primary task is residential fires, to open roofs, to access high areas. We need to get in close in a driveway. There's limited width to set up, so if we can pull to the side and get the jack on the ladder side on a hard surface, it will work well. So that's uh, our existing ladder truck has some challenges with that. Also, just some of the other advantages is the water tank. The, t the most ladders from 20 years ago started with 300 gallons of water when they were a quint. Ours has 500. That was one of the largest ones back then, and the newer versions have 650 gallons of water. And again, being a multi-purpose, that allows us to show up, have hose lines and water, and begin a fire attack, and also have the option to make a rescue, depending what the priority is that the group finds. And then finally with new pieces of equipment, there's warranties that come with it. Having a 10 year cabin body structure warranty, 25 years on the aerial, 10 years on the waterway, and 15 years on the stabilizers and torque box. I know that's a lot of mumbo jumbo, but in a 20 year, the ladder truck we have today, it's a nice ladder truck, but I can have the torque box go tomorrow, and I don't even know if I can fix it, and the price would probably be more than the value of the latter. So those are just kind of the risks that we weigh when we ask, okay, can we afford to continue on with an older piece of equipment, or what I'm asking for is our staffing model is changing. We have the staff where we can move an engine and a ladder together to significant calls, and 
and get the tasks done that we need with the right piece of equipment. Um, and it, the timing is really good for us to move forward in this purchase. So I'm asking for your support in the latter. I know it's a lot of money, um, but I see the value for us and that it will give us over the next 20 years. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hello. I wish to be recognized, Bill Simpson. A three-pronged question for this purchase. Number one, it feels like for this single unit machine, as glamorous as it is, and well equipped, I hope you can hear me better, 1.2 million seems more than a bit high. It seems quite high. I could see it being like seven or eight hundred thousand dollars, more than 40, 50 percent more. The other two parts of the question, they aren't as big, but what will become of the existing ladder truck? It's still functional. Will it be turned in towards some value to this? Will it be kept as an auxiliary unit? Or will it be donated to a smaller, poorer town or some such thing? And the third thing is, I have to ask this question. Why do I see fire trucks like this piece of equipment at a million dollars, supposedly, running up and down the street daily because somebody's cat is stuck in a tree, or uh, you know, the chickens got out and someone, a dog got hit by a car. I can see the ambulance and all that, but I'm constantly seeing these very expensive units racing up and down the street daily, winter and summer, answering things that don't have anything to do with fire or high level emergency. Thank you. Chief. Sure. So thanks for the questions. I think I hear all three of those questions quite often, and they're, they're great. Um, the, the price, I, uh, I literally um, worked with, um, I have a gentleman, Rich Corcoran, is one of my firefighters that really has some expertise in uh, working with vendors and ladder design. And we, we actually ran a model of uh, what we would say is a standard quote that would be out to bid. And most of the ladders that have the capabilities that this does, a quint that has the um, the length to reach and the tip load, th this is the, the range that the prices are. I don't know of them running much cheaper. I, I just, I don't know of them being cheaper. If you got a ladder with, that didn't have a pump, you might be in a, uh, starting in the $800,000 range, but the pump that we didn't replace that we're combining with this, that starting price is about 680 today. So that if you did them separate, you would actually spend more money in separate units. The challenge with us is we run them more as a combined unit, so I have to worry about where. Um, but I don't have a second company, especially during the evening. There's only one company on duty, and so they, they need to have the equipment to do the job. And when they, there are, are occasions when we're in cars that we're running back to the fire station to get the right piece of equipment. So we have to weigh that. How much where are we doing? That kind of goes to the uh, question you had for like a fire truck that goes to a medical emergency. I constantly weigh the staff that I have. Do I have availability back at the station? I have my officers piloting right now because we've just got to the point where we have six or seven on during the day that we can take the appropriate number of people to the call and then still have a appropriate number back that could do another call. So that's just kind of like a fine line that I work back and forth and that's a great question. And um, to show up at a call without the appropriate resources is not a good thing. So that's what makes me move more equipment more often than you're used to seeing. So the existing ladder, its market value right now, it's 20 years old. I feel confident that it would be in the range of about 65 to $80,000. I bought it three years ago at $115,000. And in the community that it sold it, I got it out of Michigan had trouble selling it. They were had it, it was listed for a lot more money and I just made a stab in the dark offer and they just needed to get rid of it. And I, we were so lucky. The quality of this, every other ladder I looked at was six years older, just in the, for the amount of money that we were searching for. Again, it had a little flaw where it runs low in the back end, so. But um, nobody is in the market other than a really small community probably that has a lot that wants a ladder, but they're not going to pay very much money for it. There just is not a market value that goes much over eighty or eighty-five thousand dollars. 
on my right. That would be me. Chief yep, Slayman, sir. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. Chief Slayman is a wonderful guy. I love him. I have two questions. One, I note that this has a sharper turning radius, and recently you had been sort of invoking driveways to have a considerable width, and I wonder if this will enable that to be reduced. And then secondly, do you know the book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? <laughs> well, that was my question. I don't know if I want to say yes. <laughs> He's going to want a glass of milk? Yeah. Good luck. So to the question for the driveway, for Hopkinton, remember, right now we're a one, we have one engine company on duty tonight. If we have two calls, the next company might come from Ashland, it might come from another community. You want to try to pick a standardized um, entrance, and that's what we've done for our driveways. Our driveway, I put a template on our ladder truck, but I also check with our surrounding communities, and their, the template is close to their equipment. Um, some of you that have requested for service, you, you don't always have Hopkinton show up. So I kind of have to make sure that um, everybody has a chance to access us that would, um, may respond. Hope that answers the question. On my left. Jeff Doherty, Three Angels Way. Chief, um, does the planning board have the specs for this so that they don't go ahead and approve a cul-de-sac that they can't turn this truck around in or that we have a slope in a driveway or a roadway that is too steep and they end up approving something that ends up being failure for a piece of equipment? I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure. So, so the answer is yes. Um, I've probably spent more time at the planning board than any other group that I work with. Um, I, they have a template. We, last year, we talked about the driveway bylaw that addressed most of those issues. The planning board has been outstanding in working through the issues with me to see. Um, sometimes the trees are a little bit of a challenge, but other than that, they've been very nice at us getting access to everything. Great. Thank you. Okay. On my right. Uh, Jim Monahan, 305 West Main. Yeah, the, how often uh, on all the calls you do, do you actually need uh, the capabilities of the ladder truck? Because I, I, I heard many times that you, you don't want to take a risk of not having, but how often? So we can actually quantify that. So there's, a, there's an interesting range. So the, the pumper they have right now is very universal. It has medical equipment on it. It's actually one of the few in the state that's rated as a paramedic engine company. Mm -hmm. It has defibrillator medications. It can do everything. If the crew is out on a call with the ambulance and they have another medical come in, they can just divert, the police will assist the ambulance, they can start a medical care at the highest level with that engine company. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance there of how often that occurs. We, we do 2,500 calls a year, just a pure ladder request. We, we send it out, I, I tried to look at all the data, it probably has 60 requests for an aerial device that we would send to, which are target hazards, known fires, things like that, a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, it averages a response of about 150 calls a year. Um, because it's 20 years old, I don't try to run it too much, so that's just when there's a second call and the crew would get into the ladder next after the engine and do a call. The, in the future, in it being more universal, we will weigh out we will probably do more than 150 calls a year for it. It may be, end up being the main one that runs out of the downtown station. It may mm -hmm. be the one mm -hmm. that runs out of the new substation somewhere. And, and, um, and we'll try not to overrun it. We try to balance the loads. Mm -hmm. But um, it may then run, uh, it kind of all depends. I hope I'm giving yeah. you kind of a feel for the data. No, 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 actually, that, that's actually very helpful. OK. Uh, and, 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 but it really sounds like it's only uh, maybe 3% of the time this fire truck is being used as a fire truck. And, and, and I understand it has a lot of other capabilities, but, but, and, and, uh, but I think to me to spend over a million dollars for something that only 3% of the time I need that million dollar vehicle. And, and really what I need is, a, is probably a smaller a uh, lower cost vehicle to meet my needs in, uh, most of the time. 
Uh, I don't know what that is. I'm not in the firefighting business, so sure. I'm not here to say what that is. But it just, it, it just seems like it's, it's, uh, it's way overkill. And I'm sure it's a beautiful vehicle. Uh, but it just doesn't sound like we need a vehicle with that capabilities, except for maybe 3% of the time. And maybe if we took our current vehicle or got a, a less used one and only used it and then bought another one for a much lower cost, that in the end we'd get what we need, we'd get an additional vehicle, it sounds like you're short, but in addition we'd spend less money. So again, it's, I'm, I'm just, I can't, I can't stand up here and approve this because it just doesn't sound like it's a good utilization of our money. But thank you very much. I think if I can respond, Mr. Moderator. Go ahead. Yeah. So just the, the, it's a great topic that the uh, speaker just brought up. Um, it's something that we look at, you know, the international, the uh, city managers kind of studies this for us as fire chief. Um, they're kind of the watchdog to make sure we're effective with pieces. And one of their suggestions is in small communities like this to combine equipment. There is a, a higher initial price tag. But again, you can put this one group of people in a vehicle and do multiple tasks versus having multiple vehicles. The flaw with the smaller piece of equipment, sending it out to emergency, is not having the capabilities. So again, I don't expect to run this piece of equipment 1,500 times a year right now. Um, we're going to pilot to see where it would, so that we can run it. Traditionally, Hockington hasn't worn out their fire apparatus. You know, so we are getting busier, and we are now going to get to that threshold. And I'll study that as a fire chief and make sure that um, it gets its 20 years of service, that we don't run it into the ground. Um, but there will be some other pieces of equipment that run and share the burden. So I, I hope that kind of addresses the pros and cons of that question. On my right again. B. McMillan, 8 Lakeshore Drive. Chief, I want to thank you for a good presentation and looking at these pictures. Now my brain is starting to worry. Where are you going to store it? So the, uh, the, uh, all the uh, companies that we looked at can manufacture a ladder truck that's smaller than the existing one. It's, and the existing one is really small. It's 39 feet and 4 inches. So this, the one example you're looking at is 38 feet 4 inches. So it'll, it'll fit fine in the existing fire station, and I expect it will fit fine in any new design fire station. Okay, I was just worried about getting more rested. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm not going. I'm putting the mic back up. Oh. Uh, right you made it really tight. Thank you. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. In my humble opinion, there's a few people in town who have instant credibility based on their years of selfless service. I look around, I see Mr. Manning, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Stistari, Chief Lee, and I put uh, Chief Slammon in that category as well. He, uh, he and his uh, deputy Miller do their homework, and if they came up here and asked for 10 trucks, I'd say, okay, I believe it. I'm glad it's only one, Steve, but um, <clears throat> just I know the work that you put in, the diligence, and um, I support this because you're proposing it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, seeing no more discussion, I think we're ready for a vote. <clears throat> All those in favor of Article 25, purchase of ladder truck, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, we're going to have to take, because this requires bonding and it's a two-thirds requirement. Um, I predict it's greater than 66 and two-thirds percent, but let's uh, have a standing count. All those in favor, please stand and raise your orange card. I have 15 on the stage.
15. Front left, 30. Front left, 30. Mr. Moderator, center front, 34. Center front, 34. Left rear, 51. Left rear, 51. On the right, 72. On the right, 72. Three in the cafeteria. Center rear fifty one. Center rear fifty one. Thank you. All right, all those opposed, please stand and hold your cards up. None on the stage. Mr. Moderator, center front two. Center front two. On the right one. On the uh, stage right one, okay. Center rear four. Center rear four. Front left one. Front left one. Left rear three. Left rear three. Eleven. Ellen. So it, uh, it passes 256 to 11. What'd you say? 256 in favor, 11 opposed. Okay, Article 26, Public Safety Software Upgrade. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator, point of order. What is your point of order? Can you please remind everyone in the hall that you can only vote when you're sitting within the confines of the chairs where you're supposed to have a seat. You can't be standing in the doorway, okay. standing in the back of the room, leaning against the wall, deciding whether you're up or down. It's difficult to count. Okay. Um, it, the counters can also avail themselves of telling people that they must come into the hall and be seated um, and rise at the appropriate time to have their votes registered. So again, Article 26, Ms. Uh, Ms. Wright. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning for the Appropriations Committee. Article 26, Public Safety Software Upgrade. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Essentially, this is $375,000 from general fund borrowing. The request is for the purposes of replacing the town's software that provides incident and records management to law enforcement, fire, and emergency medical services, as well as computer-aided dispatch systems. The cost includes records and data conversions. Um, this software is essentially end of life and is no longer going to be supported by the vendor, so it needs to be replaced. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous, and so we don't need a standing count. Thank you. Article 27, Town Hall Basement Renovation. 
Ms. Wright for Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital improvements. Capital improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning for the Appropriation Committee. Article 27, Town Hall Basement Renovation. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, essentially, this is $200,000 of general fund borrowing for design, repair, renovation, improvement, and construction of the town hall basement to include additional offices and meeting space. Is there any discussion? Dan Matina, 40 Eastview Road. Um, I guess I got to ask it. Didn't we just renovate the town hall after all the flooding? I mean, what is, what is this about, $200,000? I've been in the town hall basement recently. It's not in bad shape. It's not, certainly not in the shape it was when the senior citizens used to meet down there. Why do we need to spend another $200,000 on town hall? Who would like to address this? Good evening through the town moderator. That's a very good question. The work and the investment done so far in the basement of town hall has been directed at creating an environment and the infrastructure that is required to accomplish what we're asking for. We have invested in improving the drainage we have invested in making sure that the foundation is solid. We have also invested in making sure that the structure, in terms of the beams and the columns that are in the basement, are functional. What we are asking for today is funding to create office space as well as meeting space. Some of you who have visited Town Hall realize that after the repairs that were done as part of the insurance response to the flood, we lost the kitchen. Town hall staff currently have to use a basement that is really not set up for a staff kitchen. I know the seniors did a great job maintaining that kitchen. Secondly, we also lost meeting space. Room 211, where the planning board used to meet, is no longer available. We have added staff, and thus, we are also looking for office space. You may realize that the second office for the Youth and Family Services Department is right next to a bathroom. And thus, in summary, the request before you is taking advantage of the investments that we have done already, making sure that the basement is structurally sound and suitable for office and meeting space. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Moderator, okay. follow-up question. So the $200,000 is for kitchen, and a space for the youth and family services because their office is not in an ideal location currently? In, in a, if I may, through the town moderator. Currently, our storage for files is at the center school, as well as at Fruit Street. We have staff spending more time going to look for files than what we would normally dedicate on an eight-hour day. And part of the program is not only to create meeting space, but also to create storage file space for our files. OK. Again, through you, Mr. Moderator. So I guess I, actually, it's not a question. I guess it's just a statement. So, okay. so it's for file storage. It's for kitchen. It's for an office. That isn't what the article says. It just says under the direction of the town manager. And I will not vote for this. And I urge my fellow citizens not to vote for it as well. Thank you. On my right. 
Um, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. I'm also speaking out against this. Um, a couple things that were said was about town hall being struck, it being structurally sound. Um, I was down there a couple weeks ago. It seems structurally sound. An office next to a bathroom doesn't seem that big of a deal. And center school is empty. And the part of one of the reuse committee that I sat on for 18 months was that some of the storage of files was going to go there until a permanent solution comes up. So that's what the building is for right now outside of the gymnasium for parks and recs. If, if, if I may, uh, through the town moderator. Go ahead. Josh, may you please put up the, the plan for the basement? In answer to the question regarding fines, there are two buckets of files that we use at Town Hall. There are files that we require for our day-to-day -day operations. These are active files. For our efficiency, we need those files at Town Hall. Currently, as I said, they are at Center School and Fruit Street. The second bucket of files are files that we don't use regularly, including materials that were required by law uh, to archive. Those files are at Center School. My understanding of the discussions at the Center School Reuse Advisory Team meetings and its recommendations. Yes, the recommendations address the need for storage, file storage. We are a growing community. I believe, based on the need for us to access our files for efficiencies, that we will need both the town hall storage as well as the center school storage. On my right. Uh, Ken Dietz, 44 Alexander Road. Um, I have a uh, strong concern about storing valuable and needed files in a basement when previous history has already said it's flooded once. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to keep any kind of document type files in a possibly wet area. I just disagree with that entirely. If I may, through the town moderator. Go ahead. Yes, I agree with you. However, over the last eight years, we have invested in making sure that there is no flooding risk in the basement. We're comfortable now that we can bring back the files to the basement and there will be no water issues. On my right. Marlene Troops, 31 Walcott Street. I worked in the basement for 10 years as an outreach coordinator. My question is, there's a, ch it's a, there's a charming jail cell tucked in the corner. I hope when the... For whom? <laughs> <laughs> for those of us who don't need it. I hope when, if, if this passes and the res um, renovation is done that historic things are very nice. That is, I mean, if you don't believe this jail, little jail cell, you've got to see it. I hope it's not gotten rid of. Thank you. Yes. I, I, again, through the town moderator, let me walk you through the, the floor plan. <laughs> yeah. The floor, the floor plan is projected on the screen. If you're starting from your left, the side facing Main Street. You, yes. Top left, that's where the jail cell is. Yeah. We will preserve that as storage. And similarly, the office that is currently used, um, was previously used by our maintenance staff is going to be preserved for storage. And then you have the bathrooms. The bathrooms have been repaired. You also have the sump pump, which is also part of our drainage system. Archive storage would be along the wall facing bills. We have additional storage um, towards the boiler room. We have also installed drainage equipment in the boiler room. We are proposing uh, on the side facing the two vacant buildings um, or looking towards Walcott Street, a lunch conference room as well as a kitchen. So the jail cell is going to stay. Preserved. <laughs> Good. Thank you. 
On my left. Mr. Moderator, Brian Hur, Elizabeth Road. I move the question, please. Is there a second? second. All those in favor of ending debate, aye. signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. It's a clear majority. So we're ready for a vote. Article 27, Town Hall Basement Renovation, $200,000. Uh, requires a two-thirds majority, so we need to take a standing count. All those in favor, rise with your orange cards. Thirteen on the stage. <laughs> Front left, we have twenty eight. Front left, twenty eight. Front center, thirty one. Front center, 31. On the right, 42. 42 on the right. Mr. Moderator, center rear, 26. Center rear, 26. Left rear, 35. Left rear, 35. Okay, we're, we're waiting only for the cafeteria, so uh, we'll, well. Uh, all those opposed, please rise and hold your cards up. One on the stage. Two on the stage. Gotcha. Front left, seven. Front left seven. Mr. Moderator, center front um, 10. Center front 10. Left rear 23. Left rear 23. On the right, 40. 40 on the right. Center rear, 30. Center rear, 30. So 
page 175 to 112. We're just waiting to see if there are any votes in the uh, in the cafeteria. Ellen, is there any count in the cafeteria? Okay, all right. So the vote is once 175 to 112. Uh, in favor, 175. Opposed, 112. That is not a two-thirds majority, and so the article does not pass. Article 28, security cameras, school. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Can you repeat that in the, into the mic, uh, Claire? Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Okay, Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And Mr. Manning for the Appropriations Committee. Article 28, security cameras for the school. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Essentially, this, uh, well, this is $200,000 at general fund borrowing. This funds the second half of the final stage of the school safety plan that will supply the high school, middle school, and sections of the loop road with security cameras. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Article 29, Center School Renovation and Reuse Feasibility Study. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. Capital Improvements. Capital Improvements recommends approval. And again, Mr. Manning for the Appropriations Committee. Article 29, Center School Renovation and Reuse Feasibility Study. We move the motion as printed in the warrant articles and motions document. Uh, this is a $58,000 raise and appropriate uh, to conduct a feasibility study regarding the reuse and renovation of the center school. Are there any questions? On my right. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. Um, I'd like to know how this fits in with the previous group. They did a, there was a reuse committee. Um, I think it was chaired by uh, Chief Flannery. Um, what is this group going to do that that group didn't for free? Who can respond? I can read. John Pavlo, 15 Ash Street, uh, reuse committee. Center School Reuse Committee. Go ahead. Um, basically, we did not do a structural studies. We uh, relied on old structural studies, um, uh, architecture reviews. Um, we recommended looking at potentially taking out the 1960 section and creating two buildings. So this would. Um, further that and look at the possibility of how best to reuse that lot, including traffic flow, as well as ADA, so making sure there's elevator. Um, storage potentially behind if we build a new section, so it would be a much more inclusive look architecturally and reuse with the idea being how could it, school offices, um, yesterday you heard that um, we're short of classrooms at the high school. The potential of locating the um, 18 to 20 year old continuing education in the basement with a living facility, which would free up two classrooms at the high school. So really taking it to the next step. 
Mr. Moderator, even though I can see you, I have to follow procedure here. So it's incremental to the work that this group did. It's building on it, it's extending it, it's not replicating it. Uh, correct. Our group was charged with getting community input um, for what for the, the uses specific be, functional uses. Yes, for yes. the uses. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Part of what he said is destroy the 1960s section of that building, theoretically. Why would we want to remove part of the building? Is that part of it that offensive to look at? Or is it like collapsing or something? Because it costs a lot of money to remove part of a building. Well, the, the article um, is focused on doing presumably an architectural study in order to figure out the, you know, whether the uses can be accommodated. And so the, the question about tearing down a part of the building is not germane to this article. Did you want to? Yeah, let me try to explain a little bit more. Uh, my name is Dan McIntyre. I'm chair of the Permanent Building Committee. Uh, as you know, last year the Center School Reuse Advisory Team recommended to the Board of Selectmen that Center School remain a municipal facility. Uh, and they came to that conclusion for a number of reasons, but one of the main ones is that they did a needs assessment of the town departments and determined that there is a need for more space for the town departments um, to move into. So the Board of Selectmen, before they accepted that recommendation, uh, they wanted a little more information on what it's going to cost to uh, renovate Center School uh, for those needs and they tasked the Permanent Building Committee to do that. So tonight we're asking for the $58,000 to do that study to determine how much it's going to cost to renovate Center School so we can recommend to the Board of Selectmen um, some detailed information so they can uh, uh, decide whether to accept the Center School Reuse Advisory Team's recommendation or to go some other path. Thank you. Okay, seeing that there's no further discussion, let's, uh, let's take a vote. All those in favor of the Center School Renovation and Reuse Feasibility Study, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. And it's a clear majority, and, and so passes. <clears throat> Article 30, Community Preservation Funds. Ms. Wright for the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen recommends approval. And Mr. Manning. Article 30, Community Preservation Funds. We move the motion as printed in the Warrant Articles and Motions document. Uh, the, for the purpose of this article is to ensure CPC funding is allocated for the correct reserves for active passive recreation, historic resources, community housing, open space. The remaining funds are allocated to budgeted reserves. Uh, the sum is $1,157,990, as uh, it's shown on the table on page 34 of the Appropriations Committee report, uh, the total estimated revenues for the community preservation. I just want to make note that uh, we have a, an updated version that says, if you look on the screen, or a lot of you have it, it says from fiscal year 2019, it's really from fiscal year 2020, and it is, has been updated, so the motion is for fiscal year 2020. Are there any questions about this motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. <clears throat> Article 31, Com Community Preservation Recommendations. Uh, Appropriations Committee, Mr. Manning. Appropriation Committee uh, re recommends this article. Capital Improvements Committee. Capital Improvements recommends approval. Okay. <clears throat> Is there discussion? Wilson St. Pierre, 22 Huckleberry Road. Um, I have a question on uh, 31D and 31H, same question. Uh, Will Parks and Rec be responsible for maintenance 
of the dog park and or the um, playground equipment? And if so, what is the annual maintenance outlay expected? You know, I, uh, procedural matter. I need to have somebody from the community, from the community preservation committee, actually move the motion first, and then we'll continue with the discussion. Mr. Kanicki. Hi, <clears throat> Henry Kanicki, chairman of the committee. I move the uh, motion as read, please. Okay. All right. We'll continue with discussion. If you, again, if you'd come forward and repeat your question. Wilson St. Pierre, 22 Huckleberry Road. So I'm told I have a response in my email, but for the benefit of everyone else, I'll, re I'll repeat it. Um, for items 31D, 31H, that's the um, dog park and uh, EMC playground equipment, will Parks and Rec be responsible for maintaining it? And if so, what is the expected annual maintenance outlay for those? Jay Golfie from Parks and Rec. Um, yes, we will be responsible for the maintenance of the dog park. Um, we anticipate maintenance costs between four and six thousand dollars annually for the dog park, um, mainly to maintain irrigation, um, the removal of dog feces, and then general repairs for the dog park. For the playground, we currently budget between five and eight thousand, five and seven thousand dollars in annual maintenance for EMC playground. I would actually anticipate that cost going down with a new playground because we won't have to um, make repairs to new equipment for at least the first several years of operation. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. On my right. <clears throat> Jim Monahan, 305 West Main Street. Uh, I think just kind of a basic question here. I mean, we have thousands of acres of parks in Hopkinton. Uh, why do we need a dog park? I mean, we're not, if we're in the city, it's understandable. My in-laws live in Revere, we need a dog park. Where else are you gonna walk the dog? But, I mean, we have, I don't know, 3,000 acres of parks, and we're gonna spend 130,000 plus for a dog park, I, I so I, I that to me just it, yeah. There's maintenance costs and all. It just kind of boggles my mind. That's all. Thank you. I, I yeah. I can't support this. So if, if so, this, the second question would be if there's an individual item we can't support. Does that mean that impacts how we vote on everything else? Uh, <clears throat> as it stands, everything is bundled into one decision here. Oh. Uh, it doesn't bad. need to be that way, but that's the, uh, okay. you know, you, um, members of the, yeah. could, could. the register voters can request that items be yeah. separated, and if town meeting agrees to that separation, then separate votes can be taken. I, yeah, I would, I would move that we separate this, make it a vote of only one. Well, but, you have to uh, be clear oh, as to what you're asking to be separated. I'm asking that uh, article, this section D, be voted on separately. Oh. Oh, hold on. What, uh, we need your name and address. Uh, Jim Monahan, 305 West Main. And so uh, state that again. It's 31D. Yeah, 31D. Yeah, I'd like that to be considered as a separate vote. And not 31H? So, oh, okay, you're wow. just referring to 31D. And there, there was a second to Should separate. Should I be reading 31H? You, you, uh, well, well, we'll deal with one at a time. So oh there no, was a, no. a motion was made to Just separate date. consideration of 31D, and it was seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion to separate 31D? If, if there's discussion, please come forward. And Anya Stanchu, Nine Ridge Road. I second the motion to separate. Okay, we, we, I, I acknowledge oh, that we have sorry. a second. Okay. Were you seconding to separate? I don't know. I, 
Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. So, Stacia Frederick Crozy, Seven Lilac Court. Um, we've been through this discussion every year for the last, what, three years now. We're separating this again. Um, if we are separating it, will we be, have the opportunity to vote on it as a separate matter tonight, or is yes. it going to be continued? Yeah, it's, it simply means that we'll take a, a separate vote on this item. So it, it doesn't disappear, it's still subject to an up or down vote. And then we're going to have more discussion about this item after that too, right? Uh, can you speak more clearly into That's, the mic? It's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> done. All right, fine. We'll separate. Um, Okay, we'll separate it. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Are we ready for a vote to vote on separating this? All those in favor of taking a separate vote on 31D signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Great. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. So those in favor of separating, please stand and raise your uh, orange card. Five on the stage. If, if we could have quiet in the hall. Center front 34. Center front 34. On the right, 66. 66 on the right. Front left, 21. Front left, 21. Center rear, 56. Center rear, 56. Left back, 46. Left rear, 46. Okay. All those opposed, please rise and raise your yellow card, orange card. Eight on the stage. We've got two, two okay. Front left, 13. Front left, 13. Center front, 11. Center front, 11. Center rear, 11. Center rear, 11. Left on rear 13. Left rear 13. On the right, 16. 16 on the right. Okay. Uh, the motion to separate is 228 in favor, 72 opposed, and so 31D will be voted on separately. Okay, back to the, uh, to the motion. Any other discussion relating to the motion? Uh, and we'll consider items other than 31D at this point.
I'd, I'd like to, uh, on I'm, my right name and address Ken Parker 69 Clinton Street I move that H get excised as well to be voted on separately second, second. okay the motion has been made to separate item 38 H as a separate vote 30 31 H yes it was seconded uh, any discussion on the motion to separate 31H for a separate vote? Hi, Dave Paul, 7 Meadowland. Um, this is an inconvenience to the town meeting. I was just wondering why two big items like this are lumped in with a bunch of different ones to begin with. Well, historically, all of the Capital Preservation Committee uh, community preservation funds are voted on in aggregate, and uh, occasionally we have these uh, motions for separation. Okay, seeing no further discussion, we're going to vote uh, to consider separating 31H from the balance of Article 31. All those in favor of separating 31H, rise and extend your orange card. Well, you know what? Let's do a voice vote first. All those in favor of the separation, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Yeah, no good deed goes, no, no, no good turn goes unstoned. All those in favor of separation, please rise. One on the stage. Mr. Moderator, Center Front 15. Center Front 15. Front left 8. Front left 8. Left rear 23. Left rear 23. Center rear 39. Center rear 39. On the right, 23. 23 on the right. Okay. All those opposed, please rise and hold your cards. Ten on the stage. Left front is 24. Uh, repeat that. Sure. The left front is 24. Left front 24. Center rear 21. She got it. Center rear 21. Center front 30. Center front 30. On the right, 56. On the right, 56.
left rear, 37. Left rear was how many? 37. The vote to separate does not pass. 178 opposed, 109 in favor. Again, we're back to the main motion on all items within 31 other than 31D. Is there any further discussion on 31 other than 31D? One question. That Name and address? Oh, William Simpson, 5 Constitution. Thank you. That 11-3 Hayden Row Park, EMC Playground, it seems to me that thing's about five or six years old. And there's a quarter <laughs> million dollars worth of equipment. Is all the equipment in it that far, either vandalized or worn out? that it needs I, replacement. I wonder if Parks and Rec can speak to the, both the age and the <clears throat> um, condition of the equipment in the park. Henry Kinnicky, I'm chairman of the committee. This is something we've been talking about for about three years of, of repairing work at, the, uh, at EMC. And the reason it got pushed off for a couple of years is we were trying to be careful of where we were spending money, and we had other projects that had higher priority. However, this time we really pushed for it because it's a safety issue. Most of the, most of the money being spent on this project is actually for a rubberized surface so the children won't get injured if they fall, and that's really where most of the money's going. And Hank, how, how old is the park itself, do you recall? I can answer. Uh, at least over 10, 15 years, so it's been around for a while. More like 20. No, I, I can actually answer that. The park's 18 years old. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. On my left. Todd Sestari, 19 Elizabeth Road. I was just curious on item F, uh, the Pine Street Fields, the irrigation system. Uh, would the Pine Street Fields be in the town water district? And if so, would that irrigation system be subject to the same restrictions as residential irrigation systems? Who can address that? <clears throat> Eric Son at 60 Teresa Road. Speaking as a former water and sewer commissioner, and a member of the CPC committee. Currently, the park is slightly in phase one of our uh, well number one. This article would rearrange the park so that it would be out of that phase one and not be interfering with the water system. Thank you. On my right. Pat Sikora, 21 Valentine Road. I agree that the equipment at the EMC park is ready to be replaced. However, I am wondering, since it's a signatory park and it has EMC's name all over it, whether or not anybody approached EMC uh, to ask them if this, what would be a mere drop in their bucket of money, uh, could be donated to the community that supports them in exchange for their name remaining on that sign. Tech, uh, please, no clapping. Uh, technically outside of the four corners of this article. I object. I think that it's relevant. I mean, if we have a resource within the community that we can it's, use to offset I appreciate something that, that we need. I appreciate that, but it's not, it's not, we, we have no ability as town meeting to go and ask them. And, and so it's outside of the four corners of this particular article. That doesn't preclude other people asking, but not at town meeting. On my left. No, I was just going to respond. 
On my right. Hi, Madhu Chandrasekhar, 18 Rocky Woods Road. I just wanted to say I really appreciate the intention to upgrade the equipment in the park. EMC Park is a high frequency, high tra traffic area for young children and stuff like that. And right now it's not safe. There are areas roped off because the kids can't play in those equipment. And if it gets an upgrade, it will be a big help. Thanks. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. Uh, I appreciate the, the previous uh, speaker's comment around approaching AMC. So uh, maybe I can perhaps ask the question a slightly different way, which is uh, why have we not approached EMC <clears throat> prior to submitting item H in this particular article? Also, uh, <laughs> for the same reason, it's not really not within the bounds. Oh, I, I, again, I would object. If we're asking the town to spend $260,000 on something that we did not <clears throat> approach the, the signature name on the park about, it, it feels to me like a gap. It, it's almost similar to some things we spoke about last night, whereas we were asking for money and we didn't even have a plan or spoke to contractors about some things. So uh, again, I, I would respectfully uh, object to that assertion. It's a, it's a simple, like, why, why I, have we not? I appreciate that, but we're not here to, to it, it's just not part of the business of the meeting. If you object to the expenditure, then you vote, you vote no. If you're in favor of the, of the expenditure, you vote yes. You know, speculating about what an individual or a corporation might or might not contribute is really to no end at town meeting. I, I, I respect that. Well, okay. What I'm asking is, I'm asking why haven't we not approached them, or have we approached them? That's all I'm asking, is if we have or haven't. I mean, does the board of the board Mr. of moderator choose to respond or no? Mr. Moderator, uh, Dan, Dan Terry, Chairman of the Dan. Parks and Rec Commission. Um, I, I respect that you're trying to keep this this conversation within the four mm. corners here, but there seems to be a lot of questions. That park was donated by the Egan family. The EMC name was chosen by them. EMC company doesn't exist anymore in this in, in, in the town it's owned by another company so we did not go and, and try to seek funding from anyone else um, but I, I'm, and I'm sorry the, the key point is that it was the Egan family as individuals that, that made the donation to make the park happen thank you on my right Sarah Navin, 6 Kalala Farm Road. Uh, I'm just here to fully support H for the park um, regardless of EMC or the name of it, um, our town desperately needs this park to be upgraded. All the surrounding parks, um, all the surrounding towns have had their parks upgraded already. They're all ADA um, compliant. The grounding is safe for all of our kids to go on. Um, the material is up to date, so the equipment is not 20 years old, and so it can't no longer be uh, fixed, and so it's just taken away. Um, and the toddler park isn't necessarily because age restrictions and uh, requirements have changed. It's not really great for toddlers to go on. Um, so a lot of parents in town actually take their kids to other towns, to other parks where they feel their kids can be more safe. Um, and I would really love if this could get passed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weismantle. Ken Weismantle, 145 Ash Street. I move the question. Is there a second? second. Okay, so we, we will now vote to end debate. All those in favor of ending debate on 31, with the exception of 31D, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed to ending debate? No. Okay, so we, we have ended debate. We're now ready for a vote on Article 31, with the exception of 31D. All those in favor of Article 31, with the exception of 31D, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. And it's a clear majority. And so passes. So now we return to Article 31D, which represents the $20,000 for the design and engineering of a dog park at 668 Fruit Street. Is there further discussion on 31D? Yeah, uh, Ken Parker, 69 Clinton Street. How much are we voting for here? Is it 20 or, or uh, 130? Well, excuse me. 
Uh, you're right. You're right. It, uh, it's, it's Article 31D as it's written in its entirety. I shouldn't have uh, thrown out the 20,000. <clears throat> On my right. Dale Danahy, 25 East Main Street. Uh, where is the park in relation to our um, water, town water, what, the wells? Um, we met with Department of Public Works before we decided on a location at Fruit Street to make sure that the proposed location would not be within a certain legal um, distance from any of the wellheads, so it should have no effect at all. Uh, Thank you. A follow-up? Go ahead. There was talk of feces um, having to be removed, so that still doesn't answer the question, how close is it? Across the street, down the street, five miles, two miles? I, I don't know the exact yardage or, or feet. I was just told this is an acceptable location. On my right. Carol DeVer, 47 Chamberlain Street. Um, from my reading of the article, we're spending $20,000 to design it, $130,000 of CPC funds, and $250,000 from a grant that we're getting. So can somebody explain to me what exactly we're going to get for a $400,000 dog park? Should be clear, it's a $400,000 dog park. Yeah, but what does that mean? <laughs> Is there someone who can speak to? Uh... Sure, Dan Terry from the Parks and Rec Commission again. Dan. So we, we haven't got a, a complete uh, budget breakdown on this, the, the, but we, what we do know is that we need to contribute, um, I believe it's at least 20% in order to qualify for a grant. And we have to show that we have funding to be able to complete the project. The funding for this, because I, I, I think there are other questions about it, um, is there's a $250,000 grant that we had received before for another location, um, but, but we uh, did not move forward with that location. We picked a place that was uh, at, at uh, Fruit Street because it was a little further away from where residences are um, because people had concerns that, that, that were abutters. Uh, so th this location is... Uh, most likely going to be just as you enter the parking area for the fields, maybe a 50 or 100 or 70, a couple hundred yards before that is about where the location would be. Um, again, from a funding perspective, $250,000 grant that we um, would not be able to access any portion of this $150,000 unless we got that grant. I think part of the question, Dan, is what, you know, what leads to a cost in the neighborhood of Close to four hundred thousand uh, dollars. The planning and engineering, and and uh, uh, creating a parking lot, and leveling a field, and and uh, uh, planting the grass, and putting in fencing, and and um, it's not fancy fencing, but it's fencing that would uh, has kind of a staging area for dogs to go into and come off and onto leash, and then they go into a larger area for large dogs, then another area for smaller dogs. This is the recommendation that the Stanton Foundation suggested that we have set aside is, is the sum of $400,000. Thank you. On my right. Christine Nave, 223 Pond Street. I rise in support of the dog park. Uh, the question was asked earlier why we need a dog park uh, since there are many places that people can walk their dogs. But the park allows dogs to play with one another in a safe way. They can be off leash without danger of their uh, causing harm to other people or to themselves. Some of us no longer have children who can enjoy the EMC playground or have grandchildren who can enjoy it, but we do have dogs who could enjoy playing with each other. And I think the amount is uh, not disproportionate. Thank you. Diana Blank, 20 Yale Road. Um, I'd also like to speak in support of the dog park. A dog park is different from other kinds of public lands that we have. Um, for most of our state parks and similar type things, dogs actually have to be leashed. Um, if you are being a proper dog owner, you will keep your dog on a leash. In a dog park, the dogs can run free, as uh, stated by the previous commenter. Um, the dogs can play with each other. It's a safe place so that you're not interfering with um, other people who are enjoying our public lands in other ways. Um, thank you. 
You. Sandra Safaro, 132 Fruit Street. And we've gone through many stages and phases of different uh, building opportunities out on Fruit Street. And exactly, um, there's been no specific plans out there and we're um, animal lovers ourselves. And I'm very concerned about, um, I love animals and dogs too. And there's a lot of wild animals out there, fish or cats, foxes. Um, you just had beavers removed there a couple of years ago. Um, I'd like more specifics on the dog parks, uh, especially the hours run um, and everything else. And of course, um, a lot of things have been turned down there, like the golf course because of the yellow spotted turtles and everything else. So exactly, um, and the schools were turned down there and everything else. I'd like more specifics of the dog park of where it's going to be set up in another parking lot. We have enough traffic out there between um, like 7 and 8 in the morning. We can't even get out of our driveway because it's the Daytona Speedway out in Fruit Street. Anyone can detest to that. And in the afternoon, it's terrible. And not that a dog park would cause that, but I'd like more specifics of uh, how much um, this is going to impact. Not that a dog park would will, but I'd like to know where the placement would be, the hours, and the more specifics pertaining to the dog park out there for safety and concern, because a lot of things have been turned down in that area, especially the, because the aqua filters are right there. Right okay, let's there. let Dan respond. A lot of great questions. Uh, so, um, and I'll try to try to remember most of them or all of them. Yeah. Um, I hope people will help me though. Yeah. Uh, we've been out there for 40 years, so we've seen everything. The, the area would be... Mary Pratt has uh, gone okay, let's through, let's through you, Mr. Moderator. Respond. Yes. The area would be uh, about an, out, uh, an acre of fenced-in area. That's, that's what we had planned before. May, certainly could be smaller than that, and it may be smaller than that. Part of what we still need to do is... Uh, and it would be fenced-in, so, so that, that should be able to, during the dawn to dusk hours that we'd anticipate people being able to use, the park um, that that should keep the the um, I, I guess the predators away. Um, we still anticipate needing to do engineering. Uh, we would absolutely need to adhere to staying out of wetlands, and and uh, if 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 we were going to approach them, we'd we'd need to go through the same per permitting process that that anyone else would. In terms of traffic, I have visited. Uh, dog parks with Otis Terry several times and um, in, in a lot of different places. And I've never seen more than half a dozen people there at a time. It tends, it tends to be steady during the day. I appreciate that there's traffic all over town, but I don't think a handful of cars is going to have a major impact on traffic. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? On my right. Dave Paul, 7 Meadowland Drive. Just playing a little bit of devil's advocate here. What is the policy for the customers as far as picking up the feces after their dog. Um, to me, if that's not the case, are we basically uh, paying a maintenance fee to pick up their feces? So the Stanton Foundation, in part of their granting process, has recommended rules. Um, one of the first things we do would be to put up a sign. And we would also provide bags and receptacles. And hopefully, people would read the sign and understand you have to pick up after your dog. Um, we would then contract um, someone to come in and remove the dog feces. Thank you. Jackie Potenzoni, 12 Wood Street. Um, I just want to say, I live right near the center trail. We walk down it every day. People let their dogs poop on the center trail all the time, don't pick it up. But my question, I came up here, is a liability question for town council, actually. We're going to own this dog park. It's going to be a to Hopkinton Dog Park. What is the liability exposure? Children are attracted to dogs. Dogs bite. If somebody's bitten in the dog park, we own the dog park, can the town be sued? Of course. Attorney Miaris. Well, let's start with the question you actually asked, which is, can the town be sued? Yes. And the answer is, there are lots of lawyers out there. 
Um, and I imagine the town could be sued. People can bring suits for all sorts of things. Now, what you actually are interested in is what is our exposure, and happily there is a statute that allows all uh, owners of recreation land who make it available without charge to be immune from suit. So our exposure is close to zero. All right, thank you. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road, uh, speaking as a uh, dog lover uh, who would show you pictures of our dog, but I know you want to end by 11. Um, <laughs> while I appreciate the socialization aspect for dogs, I question spending $400,000 for universal pre-K for canines. <laughs> Mr. Moderator? Just, just a clarification on, on, on two points about the money involved here. Yes. Um, one, while it's a, it, it could potentially be a $400,000 dog park, only $150,000 of it is a request tonight. And two, and, and uh, I'd, I'd ask someone else to, to help out, this would not affect our tax levy at all. Understood. On my right. Nancy Peters, 258 Wood Street. And I have uh, two, well, a question and a comment, please. How much money has already been spent by the town on the dog park would be the first question. Has any money been yet been expended on the dog park? We have not spent any money on this dog park. No, Thank zero. You. And the second part is that when this dog park was planned for Hayden Row, there was a plan that was pretty fully developed. And if I recall in that plan, that there was talk about having two fenced in areas, one for large dogs, one for small dogs. There also were sheds in order to hold equipment. And I believe also that there was a gazebo there so people could sit in the shade. Is that all still part of the plan that's going forward with the dog park? Mr. Terry, can you address that? Excuse me. Sorry. We, we don't have a plan that's drawn up right now for this particular dog park. That's part of what the funding is for. Uh, as far as the, the dog park that had been proposed in the Hughes property before, um, yeah, there, there were renderings of a dog park, and I think that might be causing some confusion here. but but uh, we didn't have maintenance sheds or, or anything along those lines. Thank you. John Catino, one David Joseph, I move the question. This, this gentleman is it? Oh, okay. Oh. I'm, I'm gonna recognize Mr. Simpson first. What? Oh. Um, a technical question. Does that dog park at four tenths of a million dollar value in an acre in size, have a clay, I'll call it a seal, a clay cap, like a dump has over it, because like it or not, dog urine itself is a toxic waste. Mr. Terry, are you able to comment on that? Uh, I don't, there's no intention to have a clay cap to it. And uh, in casual conversations that I've had with the Board of Health, they suggested that, that uh, uh, dog urine, once it seeps through a few inches of soil, is, really doesn't have an effect on what's underneath. Mr. Catino. John Catino, 1 David Joseph Road. If I may, uh, move the question. Second. All those in favor of ending discussion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. So. Discussion is over. We're ready for a vote on 31D as a standalone. All those in favor of passing 31D signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. More exercise. All those in favor, please rise.
14 on the stage. Front left, 36. Are you going to take two? Front left, 36. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, center rear, 27. Center rear, 27. On the right, 44. On the right, 44. Mr. Moderator, center front, 34. Center front, 34. Left rear, 36. Left rear, 36. Okay, all those opposed, please rise. Hold your cards up. <laughs> Two on the stage. Front left, 11. Front left, 11. <laughs> left rear, 31. Left rear, 31. Mr. Moderator, center front 14. Center front 14. Center rear, 49. Center rear, 49.
On the right, 51. 51 on the right. Uh, the vote in favor is 191, the vote opposed is 158, and so it passes. <laughs> Article 32, car wash use, sponsored by the planning board. Ms. Kramer. Good evening. Is this on? Oh, I just have to get closer. Uh, yes. We move the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 32 of the annual town meeting warrant. So the planning board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, and April 8th of 2019. And the board voted on April 8th to recommend to the town meeting that we adopt the change. Uh, it should be noted too that the zoning advisory committee saw this and did put it forward to the planning board as well. I have a presentation. We can, yep. So essentially, it changes the zoning districts where car washes can, are allowed. They are currently allowed in the downtown business district and the business district. So they would now be allowed in, in the industrial A and business. So by adding it to industrial A, and, and re, it removes it from downtown business. It will be a use by special permit, uh, which requires a public hearing with notice to the abutters. And it also adds a reference to the necessary use of technologies that are uh, the most current for conservation of water and electricity. Are there questions? Ted Barker Hook, 75 Grove Street. Uh, I'm a member of the Zoning Advisory Committee, but I'm speaking as a citizen. Uh, I rise to speak against this amendment, um, and I said so in zoning advisory meetings. I'd like to give a little history and a little background. Four years ago in the Zoning Advisory Commission, uh, Committee, we had an informal discussion about expanding car washes, uh, and it didn't go anywhere. We all pretty much agreed, no, this is not something we want in town. Uh, Mr. Mastriani brought it to the Zoning Advisory Committee and we discussed it. The vote for it happened to be on a day where uh, several members of the committee were not there. I was one of them, so I was not able to, my fault, register my vote. Um, but it surprised me how quickly it moved through given the history, and frankly it surprised Mr. Mastriani as well. He said so at a planning board meeting in April that he was surprised how this got along. Um, more history, the industrial aid district was created with the express intent to bring high paying, high skilled, high revenue business, uh, jobs from high revenue businesses. This article and car washes fail on all of those counts. Um, I toured different car washes in the area. There are plenty of car washes in the area. Uh, I couldn't find any place that hired more than five people. I found two car washes where I couldn't find any employees at all. The car washes, the pay is all wage pay. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it does not create, it also the car washes told me is their tax levy is low because the taxes are based on the assessed value of the property. Compared to, say, businesses and office buildings, uh, uh, research facilities where we have equipment that all gets taxed, the only thing that gets taxed in a car wash is the car wash equipment and the cement blocks that hold it up. Um, the Zoning Advisory Committee, after voting on this, also had a discussion where we looked at about 50 different types of businesses that could come to the town. They ranged from traditional office buildings to research centers, hospitals, all the way down to asphalt plants and hazardous waste processing. We took in everything we could think of. Car washes finished near the bottom 
in job creation, high-skilled jobs, tax revenue, and uh, bringing other business or driving business to other in-town businesses. It was near the bottom of all 50. Um, I find this to be a short-sighted solution to our question of commercial revenue. Yes, it will bring in some commercial tax dollars. I agree. Compared to what could be on that land, it's a pittance. If a car wash comes to town, as the one in Milford has been for 60 years, it will not leave. Car washes are inexpensive to run and highly profitable and good for the businesses that make their money. But it means that land is gone virtually forever for a more high tax revenue business. I urge you to please think long term, learn from history of short-sighted decisions, and please consider whether this is in the best long-term interest of our town. I agree a car wash nearby would be convenient. I am not voting on what is convenient for me. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. If William Simpson, uh, five constitution, if you enjoy water and air, water and noise pollution, and if you really like the su refreshing sound of an airport nearby, please do vote for this contraption. <laughs> On my right. Bob Levinson, 13 Smith Road. Uh, clarification. Are we voting on whether to allow a car wash or to change the location? Because if I understand this, if this gets voted down, someone could put a car wash downtown. So what are we voting on here? So it is true that car washes are currently allowed in the downtown business and business districts. And the planning board uh, did consider that that would be sort of the least attractive place for a car wash to be. Um, currently, the zoning does not require any business to um, use the most energy and water safe methodologies, although I think that um, that would be part of the discussion if anybody came forward, but this would make it explicit in the zoning bylaws. Okay, that in, so we're not voting on the virtues of a car wash, we're voting on location, essentially. So we, we are voting on location. Um, I do think that, I, I do think that Mr. Barker Hook, uh, you know, makes an excellent point that it's not necessarily the highest, best use of the property um, in the industrial zones, and we would like to have um, other uses. I think the planning board considered that, you know, it is better than an empty, uh, empty location. We certainly considered that we really didn't want it in the downtown business district. Um, and I do think that it's, it's self-limiting in that we won't have many car washes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was very well done. I just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. that what we were voting on. Thank you. On my left. Francis DeYoung, 3 Doyle Lane, uh, speaking as a citizen, not as a member of the planning board. I am in favor of this. Uh, I do look at it as a kind of a proactive way to manage. If there is going to be a car wash, it does have to, it is by special permit. It is, and now, ideally, if this is passed in a zone that's off the beaten track and not necessarily downtown, um, and, you know, Mr. Parker, Mr. Barkerhook does bring up some valid points, but I think it'll be up to the landowner to determine what's the, the, the best use of this property in that industrial A. Thank you. On my right. Pat Secor, 21 Valentine Road. Uh, just want clarification, please. By voting yes on this, are we taking away the possibility that a car wash would be built downtown? That's correct. Thank you. Marlene Troops, 31 Walcott Street. Um, what about conserving water? I mean, already there's an issue that we have signs up saying water and don't water, watch when you're watering your lawn or don't water your lawn. We're buying water from Ashland, I understand, sometime if we're still doing that. Is, is this a prudent use of water? Yeah, through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, that did come up, and smarter people than I made the point that in areas of this country, where water is even more extremely uh, conserved, that car washes are in fact preferable to having people wash their cars at their home because they are intentionally conservative of water resources. So, and that, that language is inserted into this, into this zoning article. Okay, thank you. 
Dave Paul, 7 Meadowland Drive, member of the Planning Board. Um, I just want to add a little clarity because it sounds like some people are concerned that we would still be allowing um, car washes in the business district, uh, downtown business. The, the point here is uh, by special permit, and if people aren't aware of how the Planning Board works, if it's by use, we basically have to almost approve what is in front of us. Um, when they come with a special permit, we get to ask a lot more questions. And um, if there's reasons that we don't want it in, like abutting neighbors and so forth, that we can turn that down. So I just want to make sure that people aren't voting for this just to prevent uh, a car wash in downtown. B. McMillan, 8 Lakeshore Drive. I'm always concerned about water. That has been my main, one of my main arguments. Living on the lake, which the industrial, some of the water feeds down into the lake. I see so many people enjoying the lake in the quality. What happens if supposed this car wash per, the, breaks down or takes a leak. There goes our precious water and the lake. Thank you. I'd like to comment a couple of things. When I wash a car, I use about two or two and a half gallons of wash water to wash the car and that much again to rinse it off. A total of five gallons if I wash a car, which happens no more than once, twice a year. I would like to know how to vote to not have any car wash anywhere. Or if there's going to be one, how about putting it in the middle of the dump? I see we're ready for a vote. <laughs> All those in favor of Article 32, car wash use, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, we need a standing vote. <clears throat> All those in favor, please rise and hold your cards up. <laughs> Ten on the stage, including Muriel. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Center front 25. Center front 25. Left front 37. Left front 37. <laughs> Left rear 41. Left rear 41. On the right, 54. On the right, 54.
Mr. Moderator, center rear 59. Center rear 59. All those opposed, please rise. Three on the stage. Front left, seven. Front left, seven. Mr. Moderator, center front, 22. Center front, 22. Center rear 19. Center rear 19. Left rear 25. Left rear 25. On the right, 41. 41 on the right. In favor, 226. Opposed, 117. That is not a two-thirds majority. And so the article fails. Article 33. Article 33, indoor recreation uses. The motion, we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 33 of the annual town meeting warrant. The Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, and April 8th. The Board voted on April 8th, 2019 to recommend to the town meeting that, to adopt the change. So this article adds indoor recreation as a use by special permit in the Industrial A District, which is South Street. The process requires a public hearing with notice to the abutters. Today, indoor rec is only allowed in the industrial B district, which also by special permit. The purpose is to increase the possibility that an indoor recreation use could locate here. The use was defined and added to the bylaw in 2015 because of the growing popularity of some of these activities and the desire to have more indoor recreation in Hopkinton. Uh, the proposed change is intended to increase that likelihood. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of indoor recreation uses under Article 33, signify by saying. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Harrow. Ed Harrow, it's Spring Lane. Isn't there a 
physical exercise place on South Street, the name of which escapes me? CrossFit. CrossFit. So, Ms. Kramer? So, uh, I'm sure that there is, or there was. There is? There is. There is. Yeah. So how, how did they get there? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, like believe, I believe that's an enforcement question <laughs> yes. for what? the building inspector. If it's not a... If it's not a permitted use, the, it should not have been allowed, and it's something for the uh, <coughs> building enforcement officer to address. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna phone a friend, Mr. Moderator. No, we we don't need a lifeline. <laughs> so we need a vote. We need a vote. All those in favor of Article 33, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Thank you. Article 34, self-storage facilities. Oh. Mr. Mastriani. Thank you. Uh, Paul Mastriani, 9 South Bond Road. <clears throat> we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 34 of the annual town meeting warrant. At this time, I have Kathy Sherry that's going to come up and give a great, great presentation. Uh, before the presentation, does the planning board have? Uh, oh, is there a, is there a second to the motion? No, you don't need a no, second. No, it's a citizens. We, we do need a second. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay, it's been seconded. Um, is there a recommendation from planning board? Yeah, uh, Mr. Moderator, the, the Zoning Advisory Committee um, did hear this proposal first and did not recommend it forward to the planning board. Um, we did review Mr. Mastriani's citizen's petition and we did ultimately vote not to support this. Okay. And to the presentation now. We did want to provide a brief overview. In, I think you need to be into the microphone. Is it not? Am I you need to get closer to the mic. Is that better? Yeah. Is that better? No. Okay. So Kathy Sherry for Paul Mastriani. We did want to provide a brief overview on the citizens' petition. Um, basically, we are requesting to amend the zoning bylaws again for the industrial A district only to allow self-storage facilities as permitted by right. We also would like to add to the supplementary regulations to define the parking requirements associated with this new use. We did bring this request to the Zoning Advisory Committee, and as you just heard, the Planning Board. Um, they voted not to support this, re support this amendment. Um, we felt it was for reasons that weren't in line with the current and permitted uses within the industrial aid district, and that's what we'll address some of tonight. If we could go to the next slide. So self-storage is not currently allowed anywhere in Hopkinton. This would only add it to the industrial aid district. When you look at the industrial aid district, and as we've talked about tonight, it is really all the South Street area. And if you look at the South Street area, it really is a commercial hub of Hopkinton. If you drive along South Street, you have a wide mix of office, R&D, warehouse, a retail, a restaurants. It's big businesses like Dell alongside small businesses. It's not so much what you might term industrial as commercial. So because of the location of this district, it's not downtown, it's not on the main roads through town, residential development is not allowed here. And because of a wide variety of what's already permitted in this district, self-storage makes sense in this area. <laughs> if we look at the uses in the district, if we could go to the next slide. Self-storage is actually well aligned with the current businesses in this district, as well as what's permitted as stated in the bylaws within the district. The primary reason, as you heard earlier, that the planning board, as well as the zoning advisory committee, did not vote to support this was because the area was zoned and intended to bring in a high number of jobs, high salary jobs, high skilled jobs. And the intention and the feeling was that self storage, which is true, does not bring in a high number of jobs and that it was more of a lower paying wage job. 
We counter that many of the permitted uses by right, as stated in the bylaws, really don't meet that same requirement. They don't provide high number of jobs. Not, don't, they're not high salary jobs. We've listed a few of them here, and if you look at them, landscaping businesses, restaurants, retail stores, truck rental and repair, recycling centers. We just approved, you just approved um, indoor recreation facilities. If you look at that model and you compare it, self-storage is not that far off. If we look at the need and the business case for self-storage, It's not available at all in town. It is offered in surrounding towns. When we, st when we actually started to think about developing a self-storage facility, we questioned, is there a need and who's the customer? So we knew that there was a need just from what we're asked for by our current tenants. Mr. Mastriani owns 77 West Main Street and 1 Lumber Street. Our tenants are constantly asking us, is there storage area available? And when we looked into the business model further, it's actually business customers can make up to 40% of your tenant mix. Everybody thinks of it maybe just as residential, but there's a big business need for that as well. It's less expensive to rent a storage unit than to rent a bigger space or an additional office. If you work from home or you own a small business, you need extra space for inventory, equipment. It's a lot cheaper than renting commercial space. On the residential side, we could go to the next slide. With the downsizing that's going on and the trend toward apartment living, there's a heavy need, obviously, to have, to have these units available for, for temporary and longer term storage. So residents, business owners in town are taking their business to Milford, to Westboro, to Ashland. We want to be able to actually meet their needs right here in Hopkinton. There were a few comments that we received regarding the safety of self-storage facilities and do they attract crime. The simple answer is no. Self-storage facilities and the design are meant to protect the property with extensive security measures. And then there's also facilities management takes measures to keep that illegal activity off the property. So just to summarize, we're here tonight because we feel self-storage self is a service both businesses and residents' ne residents needs. It's a use that's well aligned with the mix and variety and types of businesses in the industrial A district. And this business fits better in this location in town than anywhere else. And we just want to point out also, there is a significant amount of vacant space up on South Street. And not knowing what might happen with Dell long term, that could put even more of that same type of space available up on South Street. So from a development standpoint, why do we want to add more of the same? Adding more is not a prudent development decision. It's our, there's already that space already unrented on South Street. Self-storage will bring in tax revenue without burdening the town's infrastructure. Very minimal water sewer requirements, certainly doesn't impact traffic, certainly doesn't impact schools. Mr. Moderator, point of order. Yes. There is a limit to how long a petitioner can present for. I believe we're over that time limit. I'm um, done. That's fine. Okay. You're right. We'll go to questions on my left. Ted Barker Hook, 75 Grove Street, member of ZAC, speaking as a citizen. I'm not going to repeat everything I said about car washes, although all of it still applies. <clears throat> I would like to correct some errors in the presentation that we just heard or straighten out some misleading statements. Three of the uses in industrial aid that they listed are allowed by special permit. They are asking for warehouses by right. That's an entirely different ball of wax. Um, I'd also like to say we do have self-storage in town. I go to it regularly as a member of the Hopkinton Little League Board. It's 750 feet away, right over there, across the street. We've been using it in Little League for years. There is plenty of self-storage around. As I made my rounds to the car washes, I also stopped at self-storage facilities. <laughs> All of them, every single one that I visited has space every single one, and most have signs that say first month free, which means they're desperate for customers. One of the places I went said they hired zero employees. They just moved around managers from other facilities that they had. Um, finally, I'd like to ask, what does it do to the neighborhood on South Street? Because there are residents that live right off South Street. 
And I'd like to know if you sitting there would like to say to a friend, a relative, someone maybe to buy your house, sure, take a left at the self-storage facility and then you'll be in my neighborhood. Thank you. On my right. Dave Paul, Seven Metal Land Drive, member of the planning board, speaking as a private citizen. Um, I don't know if you guys realize this, but for the past 50 years, I've only been on the planning board for three years, but for the past 50 years, there's been many of my uh, predecessors that have, have done an excellent job of zoning in this town. It's uh, one of the best zoned towns around. Um, we, we are where we are. We have the best schools. We have um, really high-priced homes. We have, the, we have everything here. And one of the reasons that we do that is because we get to pick and choose what we want in this town. Um, to me, in my personal opinion, um, self-storage and car washes do not belong in Hopkinton. It doesn't fit our character. Um, we have very big towns close to us, Framingham, Milford, Westboro, where we can go for those kind of facilities. Thank you. On my left. Trisha Seamus, 36 Lakeshore Drive. Um, so Ted began to make my point before I came up here that I live on Lakeshore Drive, uh, right on the lake, and it is really disheartening to me to hear how South Street has become sort of a throwaway area in town. And listening tonight, I know we're going to end up with a big Apex facility like on Route 20 in Marlboro, and next will be big self-storage facilities. I work on South Street as well, so I live in the neighborhood and I work in the neighborhood. And um, I work at a small business that hires engineers at very high wages. Um, there are a lot of businesses that are growing on South Street that are not types, not car washes and self-storage. There's a lot of innovation going on there. There's a lot of um, companies that are hiring at high wages. And I just think that if it's not allowed anywhere else in town, you shouldn't just decide it belongs on South Street. Thank you. On my right. Mr. Moderator, Brian Hur, Elizabeth Road, what would be the setback for a facility like this if it were sited on South Street? Is that a question for the planning board? It's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Shall it remain in the cloud? I'd like it to come down to earth and get an answer, please. What are, what's the setback going to be? Is this going to be right on top of South Street or is this going to be set back 100 feet into the woods? So based on the current based on the current bylaw, the minimum setback would be 60 feet from the property line abutting the street. So 60 feet. That's what the bylaw states. A follow-on, if I could, please. Would it be appropriate to have a special setback for this type of facility on South Street, or would that mess up other setbacks along the way? If it was added as a, as a by right, then I'm assuming that all of the setbacks would apply to all of the uses, so. Mr. Moderator, if I could please. So yes, I understand, but could we set it back further? Yes. Thank you. On my left. Risk of sound like a parrot. I would be opposed to this again as a land hog that's going to be there for 60 to 100 years or more, paying very little taxes and generating very little job value and not being the most scenic thing anyway. I would rather the land, if it has to be used industrially for research and so forth, and we can leave the self-storage, the car washes, and the hot top plants to Framingham. Thanks. On my right. Irfan Nasrullah, uh, um, Slackman, but speaking as a uh, as a individual, Winter Street. Um, I just want to say, generally speaking, I would think that anything by right is something that we should, we would want to be taking a look at it. I would say that I have nothing against uh, self storage facilities, but I think we would want it be be done through special permit, uh, not by right. Thank you. On my left, Francis DeYoung, Three Doyle Lane. Um, I will speak to the fact that yes across the street there is a facility it is sold out right there is a need in town to have this facility and if i'm a, a resident and i have to rent a truck 
and drive to, to Southboro or Northboro, it's additional cost that I have to incur. And every time I want to go out there and get something from there and bring it in, you know, having it in Industrial A is no different than one of the warehouses out there, right? But it allows us here in town the ability as both residents and maybe a small business owner to have a facility that I can kind of easily get to, grab whatever I need, and then kind of take it out. So I am in favor of this. On my right. Um, Mr. Moderator Jerry Tewitt uh, for Price Street. I believe I rise to a point of fact. We just heard someone say that we could apply a different setback to a car wash. Unless it's written into our bylaws, we could not do that. I believe that was an erroneous fact. Yes. Secondly, we've heard from the Zoning Advisory Committee. Uh, I would like to hear from the Planning Board why they recommended not approving this, why they didn't approve it. Could someone from the Planning Board, Mr. Moderator, tell us why they recommended disapproval? Ms. Kramer. Yeah, hi. Through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, essentially, um, it was a split vote, uh, but essentially we recognized that this is certainly for all the reasons that have been discussed not the highest and best use of that property that we hope will be utilized differently and have hoped that for a long time honestly um, but we also understood that a self-storage facility zone would not necessarily self-limit and certainly we don't have any aspirations for there to be multiple self-storage units um, and allowing it in the district allows it in the district for anybody and it could conceivably be a, a, you know, a huge business that doesn't necessarily return to the town. On my left. Uh, Bob McGuire for Huckleberry Road. Uh, I'm standing in favor of this article. The, uh, this needs to be viewed as an amenity to the people in town as well as the businesses. Yes, it won't uh, generate a lot of taxes but it's an amenity that is needed. We have three large buildings on South Street that are vacant. One's 80,000 square feet, one's about 64, and one's another 152,000. So there's a lot of vacant space on the street that still could be filled up. And this is an opportunity for those folks that do have small businesses or have a need in their house for self-storage. So it needs to be, in my view, looked at as an amenity. Thank you. On my right. Dave Paul speaking as a member of the planning board because I just wanted to clarify the previous gentleman's uh, question there and Elaine correct me if I'm wrong but with the setback being 60 feet um, you can move it back as far as you want the, the setback is a minimum setback so what it does is prevent it from being 30 feet 20 feet 10 feet away to protect on my left Mark Hyman 12 hidden brick um, Mr. Moderator, would it be within the bounds of this article to amend the um, section from 210.34, uses permitted by right, to 210.35, uses permitted by special permit? I believe it would. Then I'd like to propose that amendment. Is there a second? Is there, okay, so um, is there discussion on the motion? The, the, the motion essentially would change the tenor of this article from a use by right to a use by special permit. Is there discussion on that motion? Leslie Ficari, 57 Greenwood Road. This is to the planning board. Could you just clarify for us through the moderator um, what special right particularly means, and then do you have the ability to deny this? Thank Ms. You. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so special, a use by right means that any, any property owner can develop their property in that zone in a way that is allowed as a use by right. So the Planning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals would have no role in limiting or um, addressing that use. Um, I believe that probably the question is best posed to um, the Board of Appeals because it's a, it's a use, um, but uh, the special permit, um, use by special permit does allow the town 
to appropriately um, make greater restrictions. Notify, you know, the butters are notified. There's a process in place. The butters are notified. The appropriate board hears and takes testimony, considers and decides, and yes, can approve or disapprove uh, a special permit application. Uh, one clarification uh, to make on this. 210-35 special permit is something which is determined by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I noticed there are two sections in, in 35. There's A and B. Um, a is Board of Appeals. B is Planning Board. Um, currently, the only thing in B for Planning Board is marijuana dispensaries, which we don't allow. Um, I would propose to put it in 35A for the Board of Appeals. So you're clarifying that your original motion was to change this language to 210-35 per N A? Yes. Okay. It's okay. On my right? Uh, Dave Paul, member of the Planning Board. Um, I, I stand against this amendment because being on the Planning Board, I always take into consideration what's best for the town. So if we, if we leave it as it is, whether you approve it or disapprove it, it tells me whether you want um, this type of use in town or not. If you change it to uh, by special permit, now that's a gray area. I don't know if the town would prefer it or not, so it's really, as Muriel pointed out, it's up to the planning board to decide. So just wanted to point that out. On my right. Jerry Kazangin, Elizabeth Road. A uh, question regarding the notice to abutters. Uh, how broad is that notice, and who has the ability at the planning board meeting to uh, voice their opinion? I'm just wondering if this type of amendment will have the effect that is presumably what's desired by the town. Mr. Moderator, if I can reply um, through you. Uh, first, just to clarify, this, is, this would be going to the Zoning Board of Appeals, not the Planning Board. Um, and then secondly, I'd uh, defer to town staff as to the, um, the range of the notice that's given. Uh, it is a certain distance from the property line, uh, and I don't recall exactly. Um, but um, any member of the public can speak at the meeting. And any 300 feet, I'm told, is the distance. So any property located within 300 feet will be noticed. Other discussion on the amendment? Harold Burr, 47 Chamberlain Street. I just wanted to make the point that if it, if it does become by special permit, special permit does not mean that just because people think it's a stinky idea, we're just going to say no. There has to be a reason. Special permit just allows the boards to put on criteria and listen to the, to the abutters and public input so that we can address particular concerns with the use, not just so that we can sit around and say, Okay, maybe you guys wanted that, but we really don't want to do that, so we're just going to say no. We can't, as a board, just say no. It's just to give you more oversight into how the site is set up and what uses are allowed and what restrictions are put on it. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. On my left, anything further? Not on the amendment. Okay. So there, there is a, a motion to amend. And the amendment would change the uh, permitting to be uh, permitting under 210-35A, which is a special permit, and that would be decided by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Does everyone understand what you're voting on? OK. Um, and so this, this is a simple majority to see if the meeting wants to accept the amendment. All those in favor of the the motion to amend signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. no. Oh, <laughs> I can see we're going to be here tomorrow night. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion to amend, please rise and hold your card. Nine on the stage.
Mr. Moderator, front left is 20. Front left, 20. I got him. Left rear, 22. Left rear, 22. Center rear, 40. Center rear, 40. On the right, 28. 28 on the right. Center front, 26. Center front, 26. Okay, all those opposed, please rise and hold your cards up. Three on the stage. Front left, 27. Front left, 27. Mr. Moderator, center, 23. Center, 23, is that front or rear? Front. Front. <clears throat> left rear, 43. Left rear, 43. Center rear, 40. Center rear, 40. On the right, 54. 54 on the right. Okay. Uh, 145 in favor, 190 opposed. The amendment does not carry. So we're back to the main motion. Is there further discussion on the main motion? No. <laughs> this meeting is getting cranky. All right. All those in favor of Article 34 as written, signify by saying aye. All those opposed? No! Tally that way? Okay. That is clearly not a two thirds majority in favor, and so the motion pass, uh, fails. Article 35. Associated Retail to Manufacturing, the motion we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 35 of the Annual Town Meeting Warrant. Uh, the Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, April 8th. The Board voted on April 8th to recommend the town, to the Town Meeting to adopt the change. So Article 35 would allow uh, a small, no larger than 5,000 square feet, um, not necessarily co-located with the manufacturing company, but a small retail space within the district to allow the manufacturing companies in the Industrial A and Industrial B districts to locally sell items that they manufacture. A special permit from the ZBA would be required for the use. The process requires a public hearing and notice to the abutters. And there is no change in the bylaws to what products can be manufactured in the district. Are there any questions? Seeing that there are none, all those in favor of Article 35 as written, 
indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Oh, no. Unfortunately, we need to stand for that. Sorry, it's a requirement. No, it's not. No, no we don't. Uh, this is a requirement of the Attorney General. It's not some whimsical requirement of the town moderator. So those in favor, uh, please stand. Nine on the stage. Mr. Moderator, center front. 42. Center front 42. Front left 45. Front left 45. On the right, 81. 81 on the right. Center rear, 80. Center rear, 80. Left back, 58. 58. OK, all those opposed, please rise. Mr. Moderator, center front zero. On the right, three. On the right, three. Front left, three. Front left, three. Center rear, one. Center rear, one. Left back, one. Left back, one. We need about 150 to make this fail. It 
Is there any in the center front? No, okay. Three hundred and five in favor, eight opposed. That's more than two thirds. Yeah, I'm positive. Article thirty six. Uh, if I could first make sure I ask my friends in IT to put up the slides as appropriate to the articles, that would be ever so helpful. Can I interrupt for one minute? Mr. Moderator, can I ask you a point of order question, please? What is your point of order? And 34 was a two-thirds majority, but you took a voice vote, which was, you know, close enough. And then in 35, which again required a two-thirds majority, you had to have a standing count. 34 and was unanimous. Pardon? 34 was unanimous and therefore doesn't require a count. No, oh, excuse yeah, it me. It was 30, not. 30, 34 failed. It clearly failed. And but so, why do we have, you said it was legally required for 35, but not legally required for 34. I'm because confused. It, yeah. Yeah. Only, the, only the, the articles that pass go to the Attorney General. I mean, we, we, can, we can count until the cows come home and we'll be here on Friday night. Where it's, where it's not required by the Attorney General and it's more than clear that it, it fails, there's no need to count. Ms. Kramer. Article 36, the asthma residence age restricted housing. We move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 36 of the annual town meeting warrant. The planning board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, April 8th, and the board met again May 2nd and took the vote to recommend to town meeting that we adopt the change. So with your permission, Mr. Moderator, um, we will outline the problem that the two articles, Article 36 and 37, are intended to address. Um, and then just be clear that we vote on each article separately, so each article is a standalone article. So the zoning bylaw for the age-restricted units at Legacy Farm require that it, it's 180 age-restricted units. The zoning bylaw and, in fact, the permit that has been issued require 10% of those 180 age-restricted units to be affordable. And by age-restricted, in this case, we mean over 55. The zoning bylaw also states that no children under the age of 18 can live in the age of restricted development. In order for the affordable units to count towards the state's 10% goal, they need to be approved by the state and be deed restricted by the state approved deed rider. It's important to note that the state will not approve affordable housing units in developments that prohibit children. The state will approve affordable housing units that require one resident to be 55 or over. So simply put, we're in a position where the developer cannot comply with the bylaw. Article 36 offers a solution that doesn't increase the number of housing units in town. Article 37 offers a solution that could result in the developer making a payment in lieu of providing affordable housing units or within the development or providing units elsewhere in town or a combination of the two. Both options could result in additional children in the school system. Historically, there are not likely to be many children in the over 55 development if Sanctuary Lane is indicative of what we might expect. And the developer has built, just to be clear, the developer has built the age restriction for no children into his master deed documents and marketing materials and the, the developer is opposed to removing the age restriction, and by that I mean to preclude children, anybody under age 18, but will do so if Article 36 passes. So speaking, oh, could, could we advance the slides? I guess I have to. Go back to 36, please. Okay, Article 36 addresses the age restriction issue. The age restriction issue that we're speaking of is prohibiting children. It still will be an over 55 development. 
It removes the prohibition on children under 18 and the age-restricted development. It includes the over 55 restriction that the state will accept. One resident must be 55 or over. The affordable units would then be provided within the development um, and it will require 18 of the 180 units already permitted. There would be no change in the number of dwelling units. Development would likely proceed as already permitted. And just as an additional um, note, the host community agreement for the Osmud for the Legacy Farms development requires that if there are more than three Hopkinton students in the development, a payment of $9,000 per student for the fourth student and up must be made to the town. It is not a one-time payment, but continues over time. Mr. Moderator, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Are we ready for this? Jen Devlin, 6 Ray Street. I am a member of the school committee. Um, but I guess I'm speaking as sort of a, a well-informed citizen about what's happening in the schools, although you all are now that too after last night. Um, I appreciate that the developer is in a little bit of a situation and is not able to meet the zoning bylaws and the state requirements. Um, but I just want to remind everybody that if we approve this, last night we still have the potential for 132 students to join the schools. If we approve this, that's whatever that math is, 212 students to join the schools just from this. That's assuming one child per, per dwelling. Am I doing the math right if we approve this? I uh, mean, I wasn't the math, math, maybe not, but the, yeah. but, the, but the implication, I guess, is that, that accurate? Well, uh, Muriel, you can comment on this as well, but do, do you have any statistics that indicate how many over 55 households have children under the age of 18? So we do have that, and I don't know if I have it in the packet. Well, I'll be in that staff. Hold on. Just saying. <laughs> um, Elaine, do you have it handy? I, so, so through you, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Um, we don't have a lot of historical data in, in town, um, but Sanctuary Lane has a very has had in its history a very small number of children. Um, there is there is data available, and I apologize that I don't have that. Um, I think that it is important um, to remember here that um, I want to, I, I kind of got stuck on your first point, so I, I sort of checked out on the math piece, but um, the math I, is irrelevant. I want to make sure that town meeting voters understand that it's not the developer that is in this pickle alone. Um, we're in it together. So we have zoned and permitted. Um, a development that actually can't go forward as it, it's zoned and permitted. So it's incumbent upon us as town meeting voters to find a solution. So the planning board did vote, and it, 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 we, we wrangled over this, I will say, but we did vote in the majority to support Article 36. And largely it's because we prize the component of affordable housing and it feels intentional that it was there. And we also believe that the payment, mitigate, the payment because of the host community agreement, if there are school children in that overlay um, and that development, this, the town and the school department does get a mitigating cost, uh, a mitigating payment. Which would, just point of clarification, just go into the stabilization fund that we established last night. That's so, correct. Okay. And can I just ask one follow-up? In terms of a solution, if we don't approve um, children in the over 55 housing in this particular development, one of the things you mentioned was we could build 18 homes elsewhere that would be affordable housing that allow children. Is that correct? So through you, Mr. Moderator, I, I introduced both Article 36 and 37 so that pe voters would be aware that there are two alternatives. Okay. You are correct. Um, and we can also vote for both. We can vote in the affirmative for both and maintain the greatest amount of flexibility so they do not negate each other. Um, so there is this approach. It maintains that there are 180 units as permitted, as zoned and permitted, 
and 10% of them would be affordable. It would necessarily allow uh, children to be able to live there. The next alternative would be to um, <coughs> main, keep the, the restriction on children and in, enforce uh, the affordable units to be built elsewhere or a payment to the town in lieu of taxes. There is, again, math involved then because 18 of those units up there would go away, um, which would mean we would get 17 units somewhere else or a payment that, that would, um, a payment in lieu of taxes to our affordable ho housing task force. So there are two approaches. Okay, on my right. Clay Wright, 28 Hayden Row Street. Um, I am less concerned about the small number of students that might come out of an over 55 than I am about falling behind our affordable housing count. Um, we fortunately right now have met our 10% and are therefore protected from a, a comprehensive permit 40B, but we can't squander that. And um, we could very easily fall below that or fall above that and get a large, large 40B housing complex such as the Hopkinton News, for example. Um, I am not in favor of the payout idea because I'm also speaking as a long-term former member of the planning board for about 15 years. And in the time, since the time we had our inclusionary zoning bylaw, which required a ten, you know, one affordable for every 10, it is way too easy for the developers to just dump the money, pay the money, pay the money, pay the money. I've seen very, very little in the way of actual affordable housing being built. They would much rather just pay it up front. And the amount of payment um, is for an affordable unit, but the Affordable Housing Task Force can't go out and buy a unit at market rate at that, at that level. One of the things with the OSMUD was we got an agreement that in this massive development, it would not put us behind in our affordable housing count, and it's gonna be all too easy to just dump the money in. I, I'm sorry for the developer that feels that the rules have changed. It's not that we've reneged on our promise, it's that the rules of the state have changed. And um, I know there will be no difficulty whatsoever in selling those units. The units up there are selling like hotcakes. I think we have to do what is right and in the best interest and to protect our town from the detrimental effects of falling below and getting open again to a 40B housing complex. So I would support the over 55, but I do not support the payout option in this particular development. Thank you. On my left. Nancy Richards Cavanaugh, uh, 25 Priscilla Road. I am a member of the school committee, but I am speaking as a private citizen. I have a question on the host community, <clears throat> excuse me, agreement. You had said, and I know this is a di slightly different provision, it sounds like, but the host community agreement that we talked about last night specifically, and I know this also will go into the stabilization fund, but that had to do with the overall numbers is one-time payments. And I just want to clarify, did I hear you say that that in the, this particular part of the development, it would be recurring payments of $9,000? Uh, that is what I said, but I'm happy to ask the attorney to make sure I'm correct. Would that be every year if they have more than three students, they'd be paying $9,000 per student? That, that's, I'm just questioning because it's very different from the other parts of the host community agreement. Sadly, the host community agreement is very long, so it's going to take me a moment. So I wanted. I, I have a second point. I want to I, I go will ahead and up talk about your second point, and I will find the answer. So I am concerned about the age restriction change, just because I, I happen to live in a home with one parent who's uh, 55, and I have three me children. Too. I, I have three children in the public schools, one of whom is still in elementary school, and I, I am concerned that the overall Legacy Farms development brought in many more kids than we believed we would have years ago when we approved it. I am afraid that this could have a similar effect. That's all. On my right. If Russell. I could make, I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator, if I could make a clarifying point too. Here I just want to make sure that 
folks understand that um, these units are also deed restricted to be two bedrooms, if it matters to you to think about that. Russell Shade, 7 Summer Street. Um, am I correct in thinking that this is going to remove the prohibition on all 180 units, but only 18 are going to be used as affordable housing? That's correct. Is it possible to amend this to only remove the restriction on those 18 units? So through you, Mr. Moderator, um, the state will not approve it that way. The development in its entirety needs to not prohibit children in order to have it count. Thanks. On my left. Uh, Jesse Manning, 59 West Elm Street. I have a question about multi-generational multi -generational homes. Uh, we keep speaking about parents who are over 55, but if a grandparent or multiple grandparents are living with the family, would that count as a resident for that particular housing unit, and then would the, you know, the, the parents and then the child be able to attend Hopkinton? So um, I think that as long as the individual, whether they're the grandparent or the parent, is uh, an owner or in there, that counts. But I'm also happy to get clarification if I'm wrong. Okay. Attorney Mieras. Okay, um, I found the provision. Uh, there are three different provisions that um, uh, call for payments to the town in the event that certain uh, numerical thresholds are, are uh, exceeded. The one that specifically pertains to the senior housing says that for each uh, student in the school uh, uh, population who comes from one of those senior housing uh, units, uh, if they're, the first three are free, after that it's $9,000 per pupil per year. And just a question, how much does it cost per student to attend Hopkinton schools? I think the average that we saw was in the neighborhood of $15,000. However, uh, you should understand that taxes are also being paid in addition to the, to the special payments. So the 9000 is not uh, the entire reflection of the amount of revenue that the town is receiving. On my right. Claire Bett, 92 Clinton Street. Um, I am a realtor here in town, and I've sold many over 55 homes. And they are mainly for people who are downsizing, so who have come from a really nice house and want fewer bedrooms, but they want other rooms. So it may only have two bedrooms, but it's got a den and an office and a loft and a finished basement. And my experience has been that if you remove the limitation for children, they will absolutely become multi-generational homes. So you will be getting children in the school systems because it will be grandparents, parents, and children. And there may be just two bedrooms, but there are lots of other rooms that can be bedrooms. Through the, mo through the moderator, these are specifically deed restricted to be only two bedrooms so that it is intended that none of the other rooms can be converted to bedrooms. <laughs> yeah. And who is the enforcement officer? <laughs> On my left. Amy Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street. It's been stated that they're restricted to be two-bedroom units, but could you state the square footage of the units, or average square footage? Go ahead. I believe it's 1,800 square feet. Um, and then I also wanted to ask about the $9,000 payment per student. I'm concerned that wouldn't that also be considered discriminatory and that the state might not allow that in an affordable housing development? Mr. Attorney Mieras. Absolutely, that's our problem. The, the, um, these units will not, add, with the deed restriction that is already in place, that we required as part of our special permit that we issued, and is also required under our zoning bylaw, has resulted in the situation where those, um, those units will not be accepted and added to our subsidized housing inventory. So they don't count towards our 10%. And that is the problem. But I so if we remove the restriction, then we don't get the 9,000? 
Christie. You still get the you still get the the nine thousand. You still get the nine thousand, but we don't have to submit all all of um, that material to the state for approval. Okay, I'm still a little confused, but so just to, just to be clear, I understood, Mr. Mieres, that the state will not be it will not be problematic that we have the host community agreement with the fee. Um, that will not be considered by the state as problematic. We will, that will be no problem if we, if we remove the, the age restriction under 18 and we require the payment after the fourth child, if there, if there are four or more, um, the state will pass muster on that. That's the That's right. Yes, that is correct. Okay. On my right. Nancy Stevenson, 18 Hayden Row. Um, is, is, is it the developer that would be paying the cost for the kids? Is that what you're saying? Or the homeowners? Through the moderator, it is the developer who will be paying the fee. Until there, such time. I'm sorry. Until such time, the developer uh, ultimately will probably transfer that um, duty to the homeowners association. Is there any way? Uh, can I have another question, please? Um, is, I was wondering if there's a way that that cost could simply be um, owned by the homeowner that chooses to be in an over 55 community and have a child live there. Uh, and that, the that's cost. Outside of the scope of this discussion. Hmm. Okay, thank you. On my left. Uh, Gary Trendle, 31 Chamberlain Street, member of the planning board, but speaking as a private citizen. Um, I've also wrestled with this a lot. Um, I think at the end of the day, we, we, we know that good affordable housing is when it's mixed in and it's not just set aside someplace else. Um, but I, I want to make two points. Uh, the first is that this 180 unit development was approved at a uh, town meeting in 2015 and it passed, I think, by one vote. Um, and if I recall, I think for a lot of people, one of the reasons they were willing to allow this, uh, at least for myself, and I'll just speak for myself, not for everyone else, um, was, was because of this age restriction. Um, so on the other side, we have this affordable housing situation, and I think that, that many of us would like to avoid a, an unfriendly 40B. But if we look at the analysis that our town planner did, um, currently, as of April of this year, we have uh, 728 affordable units in Hopkinton. Um, our total inventory is 6,534. So what that means is that if we were to drop below that 10% threshold, um, we would need to build um, over, over 700 additional units before we even um, would, would, be, would, would drop below that threshold. And so my argument is that if, if there was some place where we were going to build an additional 700 units, um, that's going to be a big deal. It's going to become, it's going to come through the proper channels. There's gonna be a lot of input. And I think that there might be some opportunities to, if that were proposed, there would be further opportunities to add affordable housing stock. So that being said, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not in support of this because I don't like removing the, the prohibition on children under the age, under the age of 18 and I'm, Maybe not that concerned about unfriendly 40Bs because I think that there's, um, I think there's a lot of room um, in our existing housing stock. On my right. Ed Harrow, 8 Spring Lane. One question on the $9,000 annual payment. So the developer is responsible to some point until such time as the developer goes bankrupt or passes it to the homeowners association. Could the homeowners association also go bankrupt? Attorney Mieres. I'm not here to um, vouch for the legal, uh, the, the financial viability of anybody. Um, uh, everyone is entitled in the right circumstances to go bankrupt. Um, and when that happens, their obligations under existing agreements will be adjudicated by a bankruptcy judge. It doesn't mean just because you go bankrupt that, that you are free of all of your obligations. It would, uh, I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer though, so I can't tell you all of the possible op, uh, options. But 
absolutely um, uh, developers go bankrupt from time to time, as do, um, as do homeowners associations. Thank you. On my left. William Simpson, 5 Constitution. You keep mentioning the $9,000 payment, kicking in at the fourth child rather than the second or even the third child. A simple, a something or other question would be, well, who's stuck paying for the first three of each one of these 180? And then there's this stuff about, well, actually the homeowner association is gonna pay that me, that 9,000. It feels to me like the developer is getting out of this scot-free as usual. So I think there's some confusion here as to whether it's three in a household or three in the senior housing. It's three in the entire senior housing, correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, so we're, we're not, do you, do you understand that? So let's say there are 100 children in, in the senior housing. Only the first three uh, will not carry a payment with them. The other 97 will. It is the, at this moment, it is the developer's responsibility. So let's, uh, next, next questioner. Okay. Ann Matina 40, Eastview Road. I, um, through you, Mr. Moderator, to Ms. Kramer. I'm just wondering, Muriel, how did we get here? I am <laughs> having flashbacks, nightmares. <laughs> from 2015 when we went through all of that uh, with the vote and it only won by one vote. And I remember this was originally supposed to be retail property and the developer came to us and said he couldn't sell the retail property and put on a very elaborate presentation for us all regarding the over 55 housing. Um, did we not know that the state had this prohibition against children? That they, uh, the prohibition that you're talking about, uh, that it wouldn't count towards the state's affordable housing inventory. Thank you for your question, Ms. Medina. Um, through you, Mr. Moderator. So, yes, it did pass by a close vote. I think um, that's a piece of sort of the emotional background. It is a legal vote. It's been certified and we have moved forward. And um, I don't think that we're the only community in this particular fix. I don't know whether the state guidelines changed or not, or whether um, it just simply didn't get caught by attorneys uh, during the time of review. But you know, developers' attorneys looked at it, our attorneys looked at it, the state attorney general looked at it, um, so I don't, I, it's, it's less important to, um, you know, find out who let us down, if that's what the, qu right, the question right. is. But more important to understand that, that we are in a position um, where, you know, the town has ownership for the difficulty as well as the developer. Okay. And we are really looking for a way forward um, that doesn't take us through the judicial uh, process because that won't turn out in anybody's best interest. Okay, all right, on thank my, you. On my right. Jerry Kazanjan, 29 Elizabeth Road. Uh, my question echoes a question that came up a few minutes ago and I'm seeking some clarification, likely from Attorney Mieres. Uh, and specifically, is there any chance that the state will continue to reject the allocation of, of these affordable units because of an argument that that $9,000 fee is maybe inducing the uh, developer to engage in discriminatory housing practices by not um, wanting to sell to someone with uh, school-aged children. Well, at present, uh, DHCD looks at any deed restriction and um, any um, requirements of 
uh, whatever permit there is for the project, in this case, the special permit. Both of those contain this re, uh, prohibition against uh, children under 18. So as long as those are there, that's what they're going to look at. If those are removed, I have no basis for concluding that they would look at anything else. So a, a, a simple follow-up. Do we know that they won't look at anything else, or we just don't know well, how Well, they don't it generally it. ask for anything else. That's what they look at. Okay. I, you know, if somebody were to, um, were to uh, appear before the DHCD and argue that, that the units still don't qualify, um, uh, I guess we'll have to deal with that at, at the time. But that's, at the present time, what they look at is the provisions of any special permit or comprehensive permit that has been issued and uh, any deed restrictions that have been recorded. Thank you. On my left. Hi, Jen Devlin, 6 Rice Street. So in terms of a solution, because that's what you sort of preface have, this. Have you spoken to this article already? Uh, yes. Okay. We need to take people who have not yet. Diane Cambarellis, 21 Ash Street. Uh, some of this is a little complicated, and I hear people around me saying, what is 4DB? What is this about? And uh, the woman that was ahead of me, I thought she was asking the question, how did we get here? Um, because I have the thought about how we got here. And I want to share my understanding, and then please correct me if I'm incorrect, because I think it's relevant. Are we not in this situation because we were, we were below our affordable housing and therefore big developers came in and had the opportunity to put <coughs> units in and do it in a, such a way that wouldn't necessarily be beneficial to the town. And because uh, they could circumvent some of the town's rules because of 40B. So the point, the point is that if, if our housing numbers increase, then our percentage of affordable housing goes down. Is that correct? Yes. OK. So if that happens, then we're back in the same position that we started in with having to have those big developers come back in and put in new developments until we get back up to that, that threshold. So my, my concern is that if we end up adding more housing units, we'll be vulnerable again, like we were prior to Legacy Farm and Madera being put in. So just, just to be clear, um, that is a valid concern. That's the global concern. Mm -hmm. this, you know, the town is better protected if our housing stock includes greater than 10% of affordable units. And the Legacy Farm's development was predicated on them helping us actually reach our 10% and maintain our 10%. Um, we are currently at 14%, I believe. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and for people who might not know top level, um, making sure that we stay over our 10% housing stock minimum of affordable available units um, does protect us from a so-called unfriendly 40B development, whereby developers can uh, circumvent some of the existing zoning and, um, and put in developments that are not necessarily what Hopkinton would feel is most attractive. So it is beneficial from that perspective to have um, over the 10% certainly. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's always been this development globally at, the, at Legacy Farms has always been predicated on um, that ratio being maintained. Was, has there ever been one that was put in uh, a 40B that has been put in recently? Uh, well, that's, that's not within the scope of the, of the article at this point. On my right. Jerry Tewitt for Price Street. Um, that lady just drew out the uh, fact I wanted to get. We're at 14% afford <coughs> affordable housing. We want to stay above 10%, so apparently we have a cushion of something like six or 700 new units. So the press is to stay above 10%. If we get this tonight, we get an influx of students potentially in our school system, 
a big influx. If we go for Article 37, it gives us some time to figure this thing out um, while we're building houses up to six and 700 and using up that extra 4%. Four, 4%. This seems like a knee jerk here that could cost us a lot in the school system. I don't know which way I'm gonna go on the vote, but that 14% is critical in the thinking. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just to be clear, that the development mm. that was, was approved at town meeting and has been permitted requires 10% affordable housing. So um, we really do need Article 36 and 37 or one of them, just so people understand. Uh, two things, one, can you clarify, Muriel, as to the action that planning board took with respect to its recommendation on this article? Yes, so the, the uh, first zoning advisory committee recommended this article unanimously, and the planning board voted in its majority to support this article, Article 36. And then Mr. Mier, Attorney Miaras wanted to make a clarification as well. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to clarify about that 14% number because um, it's a little bit um, uh, misleading to think that we have uh, a full 4% um, or that we're almost 40 or we're over 40% above what we need to have. So the 10% the is calculated based on the number of dwelling units that existed at the time of the last federal census, so back in 2010. Uh, that's the denominator. So all of the, um, the units that have been added to the inventory during that time are added to the numerator, and that's why 14%, that's how we've gotten to 14%. When the next census comes out, the number of residences in Hopkinton will jump considerably, and that's why people are worried about whether it might fall below 10%. Thank you. It, it, it's also true that the planning department, the land use department, does track that. Um, so the numbers should be fairly current. Mr. Weissmantle. Ken Weissmantle, 145 Ash Street. Speaking as a former chairman of the planning board, I'd like to refresh town meeting's memory of when we approved this. I believe the number, and I could be wrong on this, was a million eight or was a closer, maybe a little bit higher, of net taxes over the services we were expecting to provide for this area. This is what the study did at the time. So I'm going to submit to you three, four students when you're getting a million, million eight over and above your services is small potatoes. This is a good, good cash cow for the town of Hopkinton. That's why we're talking about underrides. Now, I would also submit that when we did the study, that we didn't think that these condos would sell for as much as they are. I'm amazed all the time what they are. The original cash cow positive legacy farms had, I believe, condo kind of prices in the $300,000 range, and they're selling for five, six hundred thousand. That's why all the money's coming in. It's a desirable place to live, and a lot of people are paying top dollar for these places. And we're getting a couple more kids, but we're getting millions more than what we thought we were going to get. That's why we have this underride coming around. And so, so you're in favor of Article 36? So I'm in, I'm in, I am in favor of Article 36. I think we've got to keep the, uh, the affordable unit numbers uh, right at 10%. We're pretty good shape for the next census. But I was always thinking about uh, 20, 29 census. On my right. Christina Beck, 11 Valleywood Road. I have two questions, but I think they're both quick. Um, so first, I'm curious what affordable means in this context. What's the price point of an affordable house? So um, it probably won't sound very affordable. It is a calculation depending on it, dependent on the area where the calculation uh, comes forward. OK. And then my second question is, if we're expecting the $9,000 to possibly, 9,000 per child to possibly transfer to the housing 
association um, at some unspecified point in the future, then doesn't that make the affordable housing inherently unaffordable if the residents are having to bear this burden that the developer actually set up in the first place? That's, that's unknowable. Okay, well, it's the point. <laughs> Thank you. On my left. Michelle Murdoch, 53 School Street. I'm just a little bit confused on how we can vote on 36 when we haven't discussed 37 when you said that, and can you clarify, you, you said either they both have to be passed or one or the other. And I, I'm not getting how that's gonna work. So if we were to approve this, does that negate discussion on 37? So through yeah. the moderator, it does not. We can pass both. Um, we do need one of these articles to pass in order for us to stay uh, moderately in control of, of this process and this project and, and, uh, and go forward more smoothly. But 36 is a standalone article, 37 is a standalone article. They both can pass and they don't cause problems for each other. Okay, but they would in effect add more affordable housing if you did both of them versus one or the other? So uh, through the moderator, I, it, they would not necessarily add more affordable housing. I think that the best way to think about the, this, passing both affords the developer and the town more flexibility in how to approach maintaining the affordability of those units. Okay, and I just have one further follow-up question. Um, what percentage of affordable homes are actually occupied? and how many are vacant? Uh, I apologize, I don't think we have that information. Okay, but I think there are vacant. I know you have to build them, but they end up with nobody in them. On my right. Robert Benson, 178 Spring Street. Um, and if I'm a new developer in town, I think the most desirable thing to sell property in Hopkinton is the school system. If you look at any home listing for a property in Hopkinton, the first thing at the top of the listing is, oh, what a great school system. So if I'm a developer, how do I maximize my return on investment? I market my properties to people with kids that go to the schools. Opening up like 180 homes to school age kids, like with this kind of like, limited window to negotiate that and plan that is just very short-sighted in my opinion. In the past, like to take people down memory lane, like we spent as a town, Marathon School cost 43 million. We had to get another 4 million to add additional classrooms to bring that to 47 million. And then in the past, uh, I think it was last year or maybe 18 months ago, we ap approved another article for 9 million to improve all the schools. So we're up to, uh, people probably can quote me, but 57 million in the past few years. To take on this kind of burden without more planning, it just seems tremendously short-sighted to me. Um, when, as a capitalist, and like my job, as a, my profession is to grow revenue, like as a builder, that's what uh, I would do, is to try to uh, position my assets to get the highest return on investment, and that's the school system. So I see no way that these don't um, have a lot more kids than predicted. On my left. Uh, Peter Edwards, 21 Cunningham Street. Um, I have a lot of concern about how this arrangement is gonna affect the association for here uh, long term. Um, what you're saying is if there's 100 students that come from this association, you get a $900,000 a year payment for that association. So when the developer hands that back over to the association, their condo fee is gonna jump up to $1,250 a month, um, which is instantly gonna drive down the values of those units. Um, so that would change the tax revenue right there. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea. Thank you. Matt right. Brodo, 03 Revolutionary Way. So you said that one of these articles has to pass. What if both of them fail? It's an excellent question through the moderator. Um, so it, the reason that it, we, we're in a, a fix with this, right? So the developers it, it got a problem and the town has a problem. We have a zoning article that can't be 
satisfied and we have a permitted project that can't be built at the way that it's owned and the way that it's permitted. Um, so I implore town meeting voters to contemplate being in charge of a solution because otherwise the solution will likely be decided uh, by a judge. Okay. Last question. Oh, th thanks, I didn't give up. Um, so to your point about the solution, um, are there existing um, developments or buildings or how homes that have been built that could be turned into um, affordable housing? units so we wouldn't have to build new they're already there so yes so the the affordability uh, bylaw that we have uh, that the plan the calculation that the planning board uses typically for all developments um, that you know 10% of the development has to be affordable um, allows for the developer the pl at the planning board's discretion to make a payment in lieu of the affordable units or to replicate affordable units elsewhere in town. So that could be new build and that could be of course retrofitted um, units. That can be houses that are existing or units that are existing. It could for example be units that might um, be otherwise be lost from affordable stock. We have, uh, we have some units that are at risk for being lost in the affordability calculation. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, I will tell you that historically the planning board has taken the payment. This current planning board um, has begun the conversation and has in fact imposed the opposite approach um, on a recent development. Um, and I think that there is, there is certainly a conversation to be had about um, how successfully the town is positioned to use the money if, it, if money comes in as a payment um, in order to protect or bolster or build affordable units. Okay, can I just follow up real quick? Um, and to that point about payments, um, should we decide to um, make it so that children under the age of 18 could live here? We do receive $9,000 per child after those first three, but our per pupil expenditure in the town of Hopkinton is just under $15,000 per child. So we're still gonna be in the hole. <laughs> but the taxes at a $500,000 okay, so house are about $10,000, right? No right? crosstalk, please. Okay. Let, um, let's move to the right. Mr. Moderator, I just have one question. Do we have any responsibility to the people who have already purchased in this development with the thought that they were <clears throat> purchasing in an, in an over 55 with most likely no children there and in fact if the nine thousand dollar fee gets brought to the whatever you call it housing association or whatever they're now going to be responsible for kids they never expected to be in the houses they've already purchased so through the moderator it is true that the units that have been sold have been sold on the condition that there would be no children under 18 and the marketing materials and that is a complicating factor um, certainly for the developer and I'll ask the attorney if it's a complicating factor for us. You want to dive in attorney Mieris? <laughs> no I don't want to dive in but uh, <laughs> but as long as I'm in uh, Yes, this is a very complicated um, situation. This was a, uh, an arrangement that was agreed to by the developer and the town. It's set forth in the host community agreement. Um, the zoning incorporates the, the requirement. The special permit incorporates the requirement. The deed restriction inc incorporates the requirement. Unraveling all of that is uh, going to be complicated for the town. It will be simpler if the zoning is uh, amended so that we have the flexibility to unravel that. If we don't amend the zoning, we're stuck. We can't, we can't agree to waive the under um, 18 requirement as long as it's, re as long as it's in the required under the zoning. So, um, um, we've 
it's it's a very difficult situation, and um, this gives this amendment would give um, the town officials an opportunity to try to work out a solution. I would like to just add one thing, if I could, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for that, Mr. Marys. I just want to reiterate um, that the planning board and the developer have wrestled with this and it, through the public hearing process as well. Um, and I just want to remind you that while we understand all the complicating factors, we did vote to support Article 36. Um, and the developer, as much as they would like to maintain their under no children under the age of 18, have agreed <coughs> that they will may do, go through the effort necessary, should this pass, to comply with the zoning. Mr. Sonnet. Eric Sonnet, 60 Teresa Road. It appears to me that uh, two issues. One, you could get more school kids and they'd be paid for over the long term on a risky basis. Uh, the second thing is you could have less affordable housing, the 18 uh, units and from the projections through the next census that would probably eat up half of our uh, opportunity to be ahead of the 10 percent. Doing the math, if the 18 units were at market instead of affordable and the delta between affordable unit and a market-based unit was $300,000, that would produce a taxable uh, assessment increase for this project of $5.4 million. And if you use our current tax rate of 17%, that would produce revenue annually of $918,000 more than what we have now. I would recommend that we consider doing away with the 18 affordable units, and that probably takes an amendment here to change our zoning in that regard. But if we did that, we'd produce almost another million dollars worth of revenue every year from now on. We wouldn't be messing around with more kids. We wouldn't be talking about nine grand from uh, who knows where and would have another million bucks in the bank. I'll leave that up to smarter people on how to do it, but I would sure go for the million bucks. As a practical matter, uh, and this is a question from Muriel, doesn't Article 37 accomplish what Eric has just outlined? Maybe. So that's a big maybe. Um, so we we don't have the um, I don't believe that we have the authority to uh, eliminate the affordable housing. It's um, it's a it's a it's a target and a, well, first of all, the ten percent is is a state mandate. Uh, that's that's the goal. That's what we strive for. So um, I suppose that we could do some fancy footwork, um, and that's for the attorneys to help us out with. Um, and eliminate it here, but it is not the intent to lose the affordable housing. It is the intent to protect the affordable housing. That would be certainly would be the um, the vote of the planning board on both of these articles that are before you tonight. On my right, uh, Carol Dever, 47 Chamberlain Street, and speaking to you now as both a member of Zach and the planning board currently. When this article originally came up, and I, it's not my intention to muddy things here, um, I fully supported this. After listening to the concerns of town meeting, I think I've changed my position. I think we would be better off leaving the um, restriction on under 18 children and passing Article 37. On my left. Tom Ding, Three Worry Circle. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things here. Thank you, everybody, for bringing the questions and the answers. Um, this is very helpful. I don't have that on 37. That's outside the four corners. I can't ask about 37. Uh, I can think I move in, to in table? This, in this, this context, we can, we can discuss both concepts together because they're so aligned. I came up here to move to, move to table the discussion of 36 until after 37. Would that do it? or? 
obviously not. No, I think we're, not I think we're ready for a vote on this. Uh, no, I, no I, I, I'd like to hear about 37 if I could. Well, with, with all, I mean, all with very helpful information has come about 36. We can accommodate discussing, we can accommodate a presentation by Muriel on what 37 would do in contrast to what, to, to what we have heard with respect to what 36 does. So Muriel, if you, if you would uh, expand on 37 if a I little could, bit. Yes, if I could have slide number nine, there it is, affordable housing, article 37. Um, another approach to the problem um, is that it would keep uh, the prohibition on children in the development, uh, the over 55 development. It allows the planning board to approve a payment in lieu of providing some or all of the units. Money would be deposited into the town's affordable housing trust fund if that's the option that we chose. Um, it also allows the planning board to approve the creation of 18 affordable housing units elsewhere in town. The developer could buy existing units and resell them with state approved affordable housing, a state approved affordable housing deed rider or construct new affordable housing units. The new units cannot be in legacy farms. They have reached the dwelling unit cap in the bylaw. Um, this could result in more housing units in town. The only way it doesn't if it's is if the existing units become affordable units. Um, any new units, obviously, that are going to be considered as affordable units could not prohibit children, and the new units could be over 55 or not. Does that help to clarify an understanding of what Article 37 would do, in contrast to Article 36? Can I just add from the planning board point of view, for clarity? Go ahead. Dave Paul Planning Board. I just want people to pay attention to the first line because it is a bit deceiving. This article on, our, on its own would retain under 18 if 36 was voted down. If 36 is voted up, this article has no effect on the children 18 right. and it would still um, be removed. Other questions on what 37 would do, which is different than what 36 is proposed to accomplish? I mean, if, if, if there's no other clarification that's necessary to help make a decision on Article 36, I'd like to end debate on 36, take a vote, and then move on to 37. Mr. Moderator. Um, I have a position that involves both 36 and 37, if I might be allowed to speak. Go ahead. Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. If you want an affordable solution for the town, the people involved in the development, and for people who need affordable housing, I recommend you vote 36 down. So that would be a no vote on 36, uh, and vote yes on 37. I attended, attended the planning meetings on this, and I have heard all the good arguments here, but we need a solution. And we need one that's affordable for our schools, our uh, people who live in the town, for the people who are going to buy into this development, and for the people who need affordable housing. So once, I will just state, I urge you to vote no on 36 and yes on 37. Thank you. Okay, what, what we're looking for is if, at this point, is if people need any clarification between uh, of the differences between the solution presented in article 36 and the solution presented in article 37 i have a question on 37. go ahead so if we vote down on 36 but we vote for 37 i'm sorry, I'm sorry. Name, name and um, tina oddinger 11 nicholas road um, if we do not vote for 36 but we vote for 37 my understanding is the options are there's a payment made or there's 18 new homes somewhere else who makes that decision, the planning board or the developer? Muriel? So the decision is the planning boards, and it could be a mix of both, just so you know. There's flexibility along that. It could be some payment and some units. It could be all payment and no units. It could be all units and no payment. But the planning board gets to say, yes. not the developer. OK, thank you. Again, further is there further uh, questions relating to further clarification? I think so. 
Nancy Stevens and 18 Hayden Row. Um, you said that um, if they take these 18 away, we would have to find a way of incorporating them into the rest of the town, right? Because Legacy Farms is up to its capacity. But if 18 are being taken away, then there are, should be 18 slots in the regular part of Legacy Farms that they could be put into, right? So through the moderator, um, I suppose that's true. Um, it, um, it is true that there would be some discussion needed to figure out the numbers. So the other, there, there's definitely math involved. The other, the other reality is if we take 18 units out of that development and we, we presume that they don't put in any, any market rate units, right, to make up their, they're, they're allowed to make, a, to put in 180, um, then we don't actually get 18 units because it's 18 less there. So there is, there are some calculations that need to happen. Um, it is probably likelier that the units would be uh, would be put throughout the town because the Osmud and the Legacy Farms development is so complex. But I, I suppose it could be true. I mean, the cap is the cap. Yeah, it seems crazy. But there and different developers in there, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, I suppose yes, but it would be complicated. Well, I, I think I strongly rec recommend this one, and I hope that the planning board does everything in their power to keep that affordable housing stock up. Uh, can I ask Attorney Mieras to make a clarifying statement with respect to under Article 37, who gets to make the choice as to whether it's money or units? Attorney Mieras? So as an initial matter, it is the, the developer who gets to make that choice. If the choice is to develop new units, the location of those units has to be approved by the planning board. But the planning board doesn't get the choice of which of these two remedies uh, a particular developer has to um, pursue. So I'd like to ask a clarifying question because I, b I believe that we were told that indeed it is a planning board decision. And it is, in fact, otherwise a planning board decision for other developments. So that would be a typical, uh, typical process that we exercise elsewhere. So, am I on? You're on. I'm on. Okay. If the choice is made at the time that the special permit is being issued, it all gets rolled into the special permit decision. But. Um, uh, if I would caution the planning board against insisting on, on a cash payment or insisting on a, um, a, a construction of new housing and taking that option away from the, um, the developer in a special permit decision. On my left. Brian Douglas, 14 Greenwood Road. Uh, just to educate me and perhaps maybe some other folks in the room, uh, on Article 37, how much is the payment in lieu? Oh. Oh, the calculation. So the question is whether we know what, if, if the developer chooses a payment in lieu of building affordable housing, what would that amount be? Muriel, if I may? I consulted with Elaine earlier today. I have it right here. Okay. Uh, the esti it's estimated to be $210,000 per unit. All 18 would equal $3,780,000. Uh, may I ask a follow-up question? Quickly. So have we done the math on Article 36 versus Article 37 to determine which is the best net positive financially for the town? That may help speed up the debate. I think it will help slow down the debate. <laughs> <laughs> I think the silence that you're hearing is the answer is so, probably uh, yeah, not. Yeah, it's, this is, you know, this is a, a zoning question, so no, we did not do the calculation. Um, the important thing, I think, for voters to keep in mind, and uh, people have said it more eloquently than I will, um, is that this is a, the development at Legacy Farms and in, within the Osmond Overlay District and including this, is mandated to be a net positive 
Um, and so that is something that we all have to maintain, developers and town alike. It has to be a net positive, but I don't have the comparison numbers now. Thank okay. you. On my right, again, looking for further clarification between the yes. two approaches. Uh, this is more goes to a question of if both should fail. So name, if, name and address. Sorry, Jerry Kazanjian, 29 Elizabeth Road. Uh, so if Article 36 should fail, I think it's maybe safe to presume that Article 37 will pass, although this is town meeting, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so er, earlier it was mentioned that in that case, a judge would likely end up deciding because we'd end up in a 40B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this may be directed to Attorney Mieres. What would be the legal risk to the town, cost, things like that? And I think that maybe also needs to be part of the calculus if we're going to be trying to consider uh, you know, the net benefits between 36 and 37. Do you want to guess, or should I just say unknowable? <laughs> <laughs> it's unknowable. On my left. Russell Shade, 7 Summer Street. I'd like to move to stop discussion and vote on 36. OK. Is there a second? There's a motion to end debate on this topic. All those in favor of ending debate on Article 36 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? OK. We're ready for a vote on Article 36. The indiv individual who moved who moved to end debate. What's your address? Okay, Mr. Moderator, just a point of order. Can we have 36 up rather than 37, since that's what we're voting? Proper one, Mira? Okay. All those in favor of Article 36, we'll try it by voice to start. All those in favor of Article 36, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Okay, that is clearly uh, not a two thirds majority, and so it fails. Article 37, Ms. Kramer. Run to the planning board, they said. It'll be fun, they said. <laughs> it all depends on where you're standing. Uh, uh, Article 37, the Osmond Affordable Housing, the motion. We move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 37 of the annual town meeting warrant. The planning board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, March 25th, and April 8th, the planning board voted on April 8th and on May 2nd to recommend to the town meeting to adopt this change. We reconsidered the vote, just to be clear. We voted it on April 8th, which I think showed on the slide, and we re-voted it on May 2nd, um, and it was a slightly different vote. We had one fewer, pr we had less people and more discussion. I can see we're ready for a vote. I have a question. Oh, Le darn. <laughs> Leah Butler Rafferty, 5 Meadow Land Drive. Um, I actually wanted to do it before because I think it's relevant. We were talking about 9,000 per child in the previous, um, right? Was that rolled in at all into the thoughts of cost of this? Because here, we're not restricting at all. So all 18 units can have as many kids as they want to have, correct? Muriel, so, would you so clarify to be, that? To be clear, the units in the development that are age restricted, both somebody has to be over 55 and nobody can be under 18, um, that, that prohibits children. Okay. The um, 18 or whatever number of affordable units, if mm -hmm. they're built elsewhere in town or recovered elsewhere in town, cannot be age restricted. I think the bottom line or top line, the real important point is if it's going to be counted as affordable units, you can't tell people they can't have children. And just a, a follow-up, but that means that even though the developer helps us to build them, they're no longer on the line for the 9,000 per kit, correct? That's correct. Okay. On my left, Mr. Hyman. Mark Hyman, 12 Hidden Brick. I have a question for Attorney Miaris. Um, I hope this is one you can answer. Um, 
having voted down article thirty six if the town also now chooses to vote down article thirty seven would we clearly be in breach of the host community agreement or is that unclear no i don't think we'll be in in breach of the host community agreement because the host community because we will not have changed anything well everything we've done has been in compliance with the host community agreement the problem is not a breach of the host community agreement the problem is that we have imposed a condition on the developer that the developer is incapable of complying with and because we are requiring those these 18 units to be on the SHI, and we're also requiring them to prohibit um, children under 18. And those two things are mutually exclusive at this point because DHCD has now interpreted um, <coughs> the um, uh, Fair Housing Act, uh, which is a federal statute, to prohibit that. This is not the assumption that we made at the time. We have a, uh, made a, uh, a, a at the time we entered into this, uh, everybody was in agreement that this uh, arrangement would comply with the Fair Housing Act. Yeah. So DHCD now has a different view, and we have, we would be in compliance. That's not our legal issue. Our legal issue is that we have required something that is not, um, is impossible to comply with. Thank you. On my right. Okay, Michael Damasio, 18 Hayden Rose Street. This is really a follow-up question to the question that Mark just, uh, okay, if 37 doesn't pass, um, you indicated that they could, we would not be in conformance and you use some, some acronym uh, that I wasn't aware of. SHI. SHI, the subsidized housing um, inventory. That's the that's the um, tally sheet that the state uses to determine whether you have 10% affordable housing. Okay. Is it possible that these are still treated as affordable units, but do not count toward our um, numbers? I, I well, don't think that's no. But the problem is, is that we define affordable as eligible to be included in the SHI. So, so no, the, no, that wouldn't work. Okay. No, I was wondering because we kind of created this problem and if... Well, to be fair, we, the, the developer and the town jointly created this problem. Well, <laughs> yes. And I was just wondering if the only downside would be that if we didn't count them, those 18 units in our affordable units, but it doesn't sound like that's possible. Thank you. Go ahead. Michael Riley, 201 West Main Street. I, a couple of questions. One is, if the 18 is pushed aside and it's developed at another time, another location, can they limit it to the two bedroom as they were in the, because um, that would limit the amount of impact on schools? Or is it, is it, is it limited since it was part of that development? They were going to be two bedroom affordable units. If they're built someplace else, can that restriction remain? The answer to that, am I on? Yes. The, an the answer to that question is it depends. If they put them all in a single you know, building, then uh, DHCD will have to approve the bedroom mix, mm -hmm. and it's unlikely that DHCD would would approve a bedroom mix that is all um, two bedrooms and under. It's possible they have done it in the past, but they don't like to. So, um, so it depends. If there are 18 units that are all spread out, spread around um, uh, all over town, and um, each one goes before DHCD individually. Um, chances are, the, whatever the bedroom mix there is, would probably uh, pass muster. I'd also like to say that I think the restriction, if for people who have bought there or if they're going to be living there, that the points brought up by Erica Ken are, are very valid. And I think that would really, if you live there and all of a sudden you were told you have this huge 
association bill, it would definitely decrease the value of it, which would decrease the we, revenue to the town. We just voted that down. So no, no, I'm glad. No, but I'm saying this this is a much better option, and I'm voting for it. Thank okay. you. I can see we're ready for a vote on Article 37. If it's unanimous, we don't have to stand. All those in favor of Article 37 signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so voted. Please, let's get one more article under our belt, Article 38. It's an easy one. Muriel? Yes. So Article 38, the Osmond Restricted Land Definition, the motion, we move that the town vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton as set forth in Article 38 of the annual town meeting warrant. Uh, the Planning Board held a public hearing on the proposal on February 25th, 2019. The Board voted on February 25th to recommend that the town meeting adopt the change. Um, this is uh, quite definitely a housekeeping article relative to the term cultural uses used in the Osma district. The use is allowed in the district, but the definition and language pertaining to the restricted land doesn't include it. With this, this change would make restricted land include that language for cultural uses. The, col the article would insert the term in three places for consistency with the rest of the bylaw. The issue has come up in connection with a parcel that the town owns on East Main Street. It was donated to the town by Legacy Farms and is within the 500 acres of restricted land required by the bylaw. If the town decides to use the parcel for the International Marathon Center, which is under consideration, and cultural uses aren't expressly permitted in the restricted land, then any of the land used for the museum would have to be subtracted from the 500 acre count. This would mean that the developer would all of a sudden be non-compliant with the bylaw through no fault of their own. We don't think that that uh, is fair, um, and we recommend that we approve this article. Is there any discussion on this article? Seeing none. Oops. Which direction are you heading? Yeah. <laughs> Seeing none, again, a unanimous vote uh, saves us from standing once again. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. All right, let's stand on our way out. Those in favor, stand and hold up your card. Fourteen on the stage. If you're voting, please stay in the room. And if you're not, please exit. Mr. Moderator, center front 34. Center front 34. Center rear, four zero. Center rear four zero. Front left thirty one. Front left thirty one. Yeah. yeah. Huh. On the right, fifty seven. Fifty seven on the right. Left rear, 46. Left rear, 
36? 46. 46. Okay. All those opposed, please, uh, if, you're, if you've already voted, please take a seat so we can count those opposed. All those opposed, please rise and hold your cards up. Center front, nothing. Front left, zero. Left rear, zero. <laughs> Center rear, zero. On the right, two. On the stage, zero. 60, 91, 131. 131 and 222 to 2, I think that passes. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move that we adjourn the meeting until tomorrow evening. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. See you tomorrow night, 7 p.m.